six different countries and from uh, states all over the country. And welcome. I hope it's a really informative um, day for you. Um, the um, For the last nine years, the Angeles Clinic Research Institute has been a part of Cedar sinai Cancer. Um, I think that our contributions to the field of melanoma, both in surgical oncology and medical oncology, speak for themselves through the through the publications and the advances and the fact that that we have been and and still are one of the largest and most sought after melanoma centers in the country and uh, great congratulations for that are due to the to the leader of that effort Dr. Hamid who's also the chair of our conference today um we have a three pronged mission here one is patient care one is translational research and the third is patient experience and that's why those of you who are here in the facility will see that we spent a lot of time and effort on populating this space with surfaces and light and architecture and music, um, all of which is intended to create a, a peaceful healing environment rather than a traditional medical environment, because we do believe that that's an important part of the healing process. And we believe that the, the patient experience is equally important to the, the medical care that you receive. And so we, 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 all of our employees, all of us every day, uh, rededicate ourselves to that, to an amazing patient experience, to advancing the field with new knowledge, and to taking the very best care of patients uh, that we can take. So it's my pleasure to um, thank um, Connie Doe for all of her organizational um, work to make this conference so smooth and, and so well attended. And I hope you all have an amazing and informative day. And it's my pleasure to introduce the chairman of our conference, Dr. Hamid. Thanks, Well, I'd like to welcome everyone here today. I think um, it's so wonderful to get uh, together. This is my favorite meeting in LA and my favorite meeting because it's uh, sort of like family. Um, I remember when we started this with uh, Val Guild and people would fly in from everywhere and they would say, what do you have? And we'd say, well, we have just one tiny morsel to present, but we'll take that morsel and we'll make it a big meal for everyone. And uh, it's amazing to see where we've come in just a short time where melanoma not only has made breakthroughs uh, in the metastatic setting, but in the early disease setting and the more advanced settings, but it's really become the the light for other solid tumors things that we do here things that we've talked about over the last 13 years because this is our 13th meeting like this have moved and infiltrated into um, lung cancer and kidney cancer when you talk about the adjuvant and the neoadjuvant in uh, gastrointestinal cancers as when you start talking about utilizing immunotherapy uh, our experience in treating toxicities has become the booklet for every other medical oncology field on how to take care of their patients and move forward. And the other thing that's happened is uh, we've learned to use Zoom. So we now reach a broader audience, not just in the States, not just those people who can, because we used to have this right next to LAX because people would fly in and fly out but now all around the world, uh, it's amazing. And uh, we've grown as a place here today. You'll hear uh, talks from uh, Justin Moyers, who's joined our program here in immunotherapy in phase one. And uh, you'll be reintroduced to Dr. Memi, who's um, come on and really expanded our access for our patients to clinical trials, but also you'll meet the people who I consider family, uh, not only as we travel at, at meetings or work on trials, uh, but as educators for uh, patients, uh, colleagues, and myself. So I want to thank Dr. Patel, Dr. Sullivan, uh, Dr. Shao. Um, and we've taken a lot of license today. We won't be talking about this is this, and this. we're going to talk about what's coming in the future, whether it's uh, circulating tumor DNA, whether it's the vaccines approach, whether it's the utilization of radiation or the newer 
uh, immunotherapies. But in order to keep on time and enjoy so everyone can go back and look at the highlights of the coronation, I'm gonna I'm gonna introduce uh, just Justin Moyers. Dr. Moyers joins us uh, as um, a, a leader in phase one immuno. He, for those of you who've never met him, not only did he train in hematology oncology, he said, I haven't learned enough and did another fellowship in, in phase one. So we're gonna spend time, he and I getting to uh, know each other and he's gonna teach me a lot, but today he's gonna talk about a novel immunotherapy combinations to begin the journey with melanoma. So Dr. Moyers, please come up. Your slides will appear up there. Great. Give me this too. Okay. Yeah, oh, it's this. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. Thank you all. Um, great to um, start off this uh, series of uh, presentations today. Um, I hope we don't have just a super bloom here today, but just also a super presentation day. Um, so like you said, I'm Dr. Moyers. Um, just started here last month at the Angeles Clinic. I'm excited to uh, um, lead, lead off this group. Um, so, so as an outline of what we'll talk about today, briefly in my conversation, uh, my, my, my discussion, um, we'll first start out <clears throat> the um, rationale for some combinations and what's historically been seen already with the single agents. Um, next, we'll move on to some of the improved combinations and discuss Nevo and Ipi, as well as Nevo and Rilatlamab. Um, and then also at the end, um, discuss a couple of the um, up and coming things and things that are um, going on at our um, clinic here. So melanoma tumors are comprised not only of cancer cells, but of a host of immune cells in the so-called tumor microenvironment. The balance of this tumor microenvironment is dependent upon a um, host of factors. Some of the cells cause an immune suppressive environment, such as the regulatory T cells, pro-tumor T cells and myelo-derived suppressor cells, while cytotoxic T cells and T helper cells are positive immune regulators. The goal of immunotherapy is to tip the scales in the direction of the tumor death for a positive immune regulator environment to elicit tumor death. Um, two of the first um, checkpoints discovered um, were found to block anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1. This is a schematic representation of the immune cell types primarily affected by anti-CTLA-4 in the red arrows and anti-PD-1 in the blue arrows, as reported in humans. Um, notably, most of these cell types express the targets of um, immune checkpoint blockade, potentially explaining their peripheral modulation after immune checkpoint blockade. Um, Anti-CTLA-4 um, blockade induces T helper one cells um, to a factor and T, um, uh, while counteracting T regulatory function and possibly expanding um, T X, uh, X cells. So this led to the, uh, the the trial of first checkpoint inhibitor that was approved, the anti-CTLA-4 ipilimumab. Um, it was dr a dramatic improvement in the treatment of metastatic melanoma compared to cytotoxic chemotherapy and led to some durable survival and appeared to have some, uh, that had to have some dose dependency. However, only about a, third, a fourth to a fifth of patients had a long-term survival effect as we see in that tail at the right end of the graph. Um, next came anti-PD-1. Um, with nivolumab and pembrolizumab in several key trials. And one of the ones I'll show real quick, in Keynote 006 in the long-term follow-up, anti-CTLA-4 ipilimumab was compared to pembrolizumab at two different dosing regimens. PD-1 pembrolizumab combined cohorts were found to improve median and overall survival of 32.7 months versus 15.9 months compared to anti-CTLA-4 in the long-term follow-up. This led rationally to think, well, if one is good, maybe two better. So the combination of anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1 was also compared to single agents. Patients were assigned to three treatment arms, equal ratios of the three treatments to nivolumab alone, ipilimumab alone, or the combined nevo and. Um, initial results showed superior 
or you of the combination over either drug in single agent form with the highest objective response rate illustrating tumor shrinkage in over half of patients. 50% of patients to over just over 15% for, um, but by over 15% difference to nivolumab. How, as with any effective treatment, side effects occur and occurred universally, you know, in all three groups to some degree. Serious side effects graded as three or four occurred in most of the combination patients at just under 70% and nivolumab at 40%. Side effects led to discontinuation in about 30% of the combination group and, you know, only uh, 5% of the single agent nevo group. Um, since this trial started a while back, um, we now have long-term survival follow-up at six and a half years. Median overall survival is just over six years for the combination, um, with a landmark survival at six and a half years of just under 50% at 49%. Um, this combination was also in patients with brain metastasis in a cohort of 101 patients with asymptomatic metastasis and a cohort of 18 patients with asymptomatic metastasis in the Checkmate 204 study. In the asymptomatic cohort, the intracranial benefit rate or the, you know, the shrinkage of brain metastasis was 57% and 30% of the cohort achieving a complete response of the brain metastasis. The landmark survival at 36 months was 71.9% in the asymptomatic cohort and only 18.9% in the symptomatic cohort. So we see that this is not only effective in the body, but in the brain as well. <clears throat> so these, this, these studies show that the combination dual checkpoint inhibitor was superior to single agent. However, as we discussed, um, the, the treatment's quite toxic, it leads to lots of side effects. And so is there a, you know, a path to um, getting uh, a, a better side effect profile for patients? So Checkmate 511, well, Checkmate 511 um, tested a flip dose of ipilimumab and nivolumab using one milligram per kilogram of ipilimumab and three milligrams of kilo per kilogram of nivolumab instead of um, the, the inverse. The initial dose of four, for the initial dose of the four immunotherapies. Um, as seen on the right, the median progression free survival in overall survival were not significantly different at this um, first initial presentation with median PFS around nine months um, and median overall survival not reached for either group. But the, here's the kicker is that the side effect profile was substantially better for the quote unquote flip dose, the Nevo 3 IP1 at 34% serious or grade three to five events, whereas only um, uh, whereas is increased number of 48%, so nearly half had serious side effects on the IPI-3 arm. Next, we moved on to a novel checkpoint. LAG-3 regulates a checkpoint pathway that limits the activity of T-cells, as well as may lead to resistance in immunotherapy experienced patients. The relatinumab anti-LAG-3 was a anti-LAG-3 agent that was tested in combination with nivolumab. Um, and we saw this in Relativity 047. It had an every four week dose regimen comparing nivolumab alone um, with nivolumab and relatilumab. Progression, <clears throat> Progression free survival was different and met statistical significance over nivolumab alone when overall survival was longer in the relatilumab as well but not uh, significant yet. Um, and then we looked at, you know, does the lag three, how much lag three is on the cells affect how well it works? And that if the lag three expression was greater than 1%, there's only, there was a trend, there was a um, improved survival in the combination. However, only a trend was towards improvement was seen in the combination arm. We also saw that the side effect profile showed that the <clears throat> Nevo and relatilumab arm was not nearly as uh, difference of toxicity as compared to nivolumab alone as we saw with the Nevo and Ipi. And so serious side effects occurred in about 20% of the combination arm, only 11% of the single agent arm. And so putting it all together, I like this um, slide borrowed from Dr. Dowd um, that shows the um, x-axis on the bottom, the progression-free survival, and on the y-axis, the, the grade three or four serious events. 
Um, and so we saw that while Checkmate 6.7, the Nevo and Ipi at the standard dose was the most um, effective and most toxic, um, when you either switch it to the flip dose or add relatlimab instead of ipilimumab to nivolumab, um, we see a nearly uh, equivalent progression-free survival, but significantly reduced um, side effects. So is there something on the horizon about to make a big splash? Do we need some more immunotherapy combinations? There, um, while immunotherapy <clears throat> has allowed the field of oncology to turn a critical corner, um, where there's even long-term survival and even durable cures, um, many patients still don't benefit from these checkpoint inhibitor therapies. There's the thought is immune suppressive environment um, resists reversal through several mechanisms. One can suppress suppressive cytokines or anti-inflammatory immune molecules. Two, lack of antigen presentation causing the immune system to not properly recognize cancer as foreign, programmed cell death mechanisms, or a hostile met metabolic state. Therefore, new therapies are needed to overcome these obstacles. Our own Dr. Hamid presented in Paris the phase one results of the novel combination of simlipumab as well as fianlimab, <clears throat> um, an anti-lag-3 checkpoint inhibitor that enrolled patients here at the Angeles Clinic. Um, in this study, 76% of patients had a level of tumor reduction um, with the best response uh, with median progression-free survival of 24.0 months um, for the PD-1 naive patients. We're awaiting release on more data of this exciting combination. <clears throat> um, last month, Dr. Um, Dumer uh, presented at the AECR conference, Keymaker U02. This trial compared three different neoadjuvant combinations, uh, or sorry, two combinations and one control arm of pembrolizumab um, or pembrolizumab plus intratumoral uh, gebisextarev um, or pembrolizumab and vibastolumab, another checkpoint um, and anti-tigit antibody. Um, the pembro plus vivo arm had responses in 81% of patients in comparison to the pembrolizumab alarm had about 73%. Obviously these numbers are way too small given the number of patients in each group to make um, comparisons between the ar arms. However, the pembrolizumab plus vivo is um, pretty um, encouraging and exciting. Um, another um, combination that we're excited here uh, at the Angels Clinic is that's enrolling, um, uses sirolimab. Um, this is an IL-6 um, receptor blocking antibody. This trial is um, um, used in combination with NEVO and IPI in unresectable and metastatic melanomas. So what's next? Thus far, we've discussed the effects of checkpoint inhibitors as being anti-tumor effect to cancer. How are the other points in the cancer immunity cycle where <clears throat> immunotherapy may be useful? Oncolytic viruses and peptides can cause tumor death and release tumor-driven antigens. Um, and there's also a potential to affect trafficking and infiltration of activated T cells into the tumors, other places that might be helpful. Um, others will be talking about um, you know, further strategies um, for to treat melanoma today. Um, and some of them um, uh, play directly to target the um, cells through tumor delf with cytotoxic systemic chemotherapy, radiation therapy, molecular targeted agents, epigenetic modifiers, um, all directly affect the tumor. Indirect uh, methods to modify the tumor microenvironment and the tumor to uh, favor anti-tumor immunity um, include enhancing the effect of effector T cells in antigen presenting cells or trying to block the inhibiting agents such as regulatory T cells. Um, another hot topic is the modification of the gut, gut microbiome, the local vasculature of the immune system, the cytokine milieu, altering cellular metabolism. Um, it's, it's likely that this complex interplay is not acting in isolation and all these arms are dependent on one another. Um, we started out with the treatments aimed at PD-1 and CTLA-4, but as we can see, there's lots more potential um, to, to target in um, the cancer um, environment for melanoma. Um, thank you for your time. I'm glad to... Um,
give the microphone over to Dr. Memi or Dr. Hui, sorry. All right. Well, thank you, but before we go, let's get a couple of, all right. All right, there we go. Uh, so before we move on, a couple of uh, things. Wow, that was a tour de force with a lot of information, but I think you'll understand to begin with that uh, we've now moved on and are putting more pieces together. Uh, we have with us today one of our patients who is one of the first patients to ever go on to just two drugs together and uh, show us how well it works. And uh, you, you missed one of the trials that Dr. Sullivan is also working on is now not just the PD-1, not just the CTLA-4, but also adding the LAG-3 and an extra IL-6 inhibitor to decrease toxicity, increase efficacy. And this is not a novel idea. It's just an idea that has to be nurtured through places like MD Anderson and <clears throat> Matt general and through the research and through the patient's involvement in these trials, how to make things better, less harmful, because the last slide shows where we want to be. We want to have our nutritionist give you something for the microbiome. We want to have our health advocate tell you how much you need to exercise to get the immune system going. You need to we need to have the right therapies. You need to give us some of your blood and your hair and everything so we can just personalize it so the geneticist can help. So a whole team will then take care of you. And then of course, a Manny Petty at the same time. <laughs> but that's the, the future and uh, where we've gone to. It just, uh, this meeting is not just an educational thing. It's a mandate for the physicians who show up here uh, to go back and give us more information or something new for next year, something new for next year. Uh, but one of the, the newest information and the hottest information comes from uh, work that's been done through the Southwest Oncology Group, uh, SWAG, looking at what's the best way to treat someone who has localized melanoma. Uh, and the, the, the words that we never talked about, adjuvant and neoadjuvant and the clinical trials that are there. Uh, You'll, Dr. Memi is going to come up and give us that talk, but it will reference a lot of the work that Dr. Patel has done and led as her in her role as president of SWOG. Um, so I'd like to bring up Dr. Memi to give us that information and um, explain it all. Hey, good morning. Thank you for... Uh... Let me say a few words on the work that Dr. Patel and others have done. Uh, I'm a huge fan of you. Um, so today, I mean, I just as already set up a, a perfect stage in terms of what immunotherapy is and what does it mean in melanoma in advanced setting. Um, I think just like all the other malignancies, new drugs are tried in advanced stages, and then we take a step back and think, can we prevent the advanced stage from even showing up? Can we try these drugs that are so impactful in stage four disease? Is it possible to bring them in earlier and not allow for that stage four to even happen? And that's what we're gonna talk about today. I'm talking about function of immunotherapy in pre-surgery or post-surgery setting, meaning somebody who has either lymph node negative, uh, high-risk melanoma of the skin, or lymph node positive uh, melanoma that carries a fairly high risk of recurrences, meaning the disease coming back and causing you know, morbidities, mortalities, and those kind of issues. And can we change that paradigm? So these are the objectives uh, of my talk today. Uh, just wanted to give you a little sort of glimpse into what was and what is uh, in melanoma. And if you look at back in the 70s, we only had decarbazine, alkylating cytotoxic chemotherapy, didn't really work all that well. 
uh, was very toxic. Um, and then came along some of the side lines, the interleukins, the interferons. Those two were toxic, poorly tolerated, and the benefit was limited. Then there was an explosion of therapies when you're looking at in the 2000s from targeted therapies to immunotherapies. And now we're looking at combinations, new checkpoint inhibitors, newer combination, new ways to give those drugs to reduce the toxicity and keeping their benefit intact. So I will first a uh, few minutes I will spend on uh, looking at adjuvant, traditional adjuvant setting immunotherapeutics in, in early stage melanoma with high risk no negative disease, which is 2B2C. And then we'll take a look at some of the trials that have happened and the results have been reported, FDA approval has been granted uh, for node positive disease. And then what's coming down the pike uh, in future trials. And then I'll, hopefully I'll have more than enough time to spend on neoadjuvant approach. Um, that is essentially, is, is the, the latest thing, probably the greatest thing in melanoma in my opinion. Excuse me. So we'll dive right into it. This is the uh, one of the studies that I'm highlighting, looking at stage 2B2C disease, which is sentinel lymph node negative melanoma, still carries a fairly high risk of recurrences, looking at 976 patients that were treated with Iberlizumab or placebo. And, uh, and some of the characteristics of those patients are uh, highlighted there. And at the first interim analysis, you see that there is a reduced risk of recurrences in uh, patients treated with pembrolizumab. At the second interim analysis, again, it showed that there was improved um, uh, relapse free of survival uh, or risk or recurrence risks were decreased with pembrolizumab. And I think one of the things that we need to highlight, not only that these therapies are effective in that setting, they're also fairly uh, well tolerated. Uh, most of the time, these PD-1s or pembrolizumabs or nivolumabs, a single agent are easily tolerated. Uh, most common adverse events tend to be fatigue, uh, joint aches and pains, muscle aches and pains, um, uh, sort of, you know, flu-like symptoms kind of thing. But most of the time, it's well tolerated. There are some high-risk toxicity that are possible, but most of the time, they tend not to happen as frequently allowing this to be a, a more than reasonable therapy for a lot of the patient population with this particular stage of disease. So jump into high risk node positive disease. This is one of the older studies um, looking at ipilimumab versus placebo in node positive disease. The phase three study looked at, you know, close to a thousand patients randomized to either 10 mill milligram per kilogram ipilimumab, which is also a year boy versus placebo. And with the primary endpoint of relapse free survival, the five year RFS rate was 40% with IPI and 30% for uh, placebo. And then also there was a secondary endpoint of overall survival advantage. Does giving this, this particular drug, ipilimumab, live, makes you live longer? And that was the case. Uh, and the challenge with ipilimumab, as, as Justin described, is the toxicity. Yeah, at particularly 10 milligram per kilogram dose. And it is one of the toxic drugs leading to well over 50% rate of toxicity uh, versus placebo. Uh, but this is probably, it, it is the, one of the first drugs that, that established overall survival in adjuvant setting in melanoma. So next question, is, is there something better? Is there a drug that really help us uh, decrease risk of recurrences, but not be as toxic. And that is precisely the trial that looked uh, at this particular question in Checkmate 238. And that particular study randomized 960 patients to either IPI or NEVO and with a primary endpoint of RFS, which is relapse-free survival. And again, the goal was accomplished. And uh, on top of it, not only nivolumab was better in terms of uh, RFS benefit, it's also a lot less toxic. Again, taking the step of improving therapy from the point of view tolerance and also from benefit as well. So not to be outdone by um, one pharma, and you know, 
So you have a competitor and looking at pembrolizumab uh, in, uh, in node positive high risk disease. And these patients were either getting pembrolizumab or placebo in a phase three double blinded uh, placebo controlled trial in a high risk melanoma. Again, uh, pembrolizumab was very effective in decreasing risk of recurrences uh, and overall very, very well tolerated in terms of uh, toxicity profile. So some of the patients may not be candidate for nivolumab or pembrolizumab or any other immunotherapies because they have autoimmune disease issues or you know, some other um, issues, and uh, that doesn't allow them to be a candidate for uh, uh, immunotherapeutics, and do they have an option? So as you know, about 40 to 45% of the uh, cutaneous meloma patients carry a BRAF mutation, the B600E or K, that is a very targetable way of the combination uh, targeted therapy. Bemurafenib, cobimitinib um, in metastatic setting is approved. Uh, Encorafenib, binimitinib in metastatic setting is approved. And trametinib, dibrafenib is also uh, approved in metastatic setting. And that was also studied in earlier stage disease, looking at phase three double-blinded placebo control study in uh, mutated melanoma with the V600E or K. And again, uh, primary endpoint was three-year RFS, and that was achieved by the combination and uh, all the trend towards overall survival advantage. Uh, this therapy, again, is reasonably well tolerated. Most common adverse event tends to be fever, arthralgias and myalgias, uh, but either using antipyritics like Tylenol or ibuprofen, you tend to reduce that um, toxicity, or if it continues to occur, dose reduction and, and some other, um, at times we view low dose prednisone to reduce uh, those pyritic events. So this is the latest and greatest. It was recently presented by Dr. Weber at the AACR conference. It happened about a month ago. Uh, this is Moderna's mRNA4157 uh, with or without pembrolizumab. Uh, it's a personalized. This is as personalized a cancer therapy gets. Uh, on the left bottom is essentially a schematic of what this mRNA vaccine is. You obtain patient's uh, tumor sample and then you isolate the RNA and that RNA and some of that information is fed into a computer algorithm, then it spits out about 34 different neoantigens, pieces of information that our immune system can take, learn, and then survey for melanoma. And that then is given back to the patient, that vaccine is given back to the patient to reduce the risk of recurrences. So in my opinion, this is not a true adjuvant study. This is almost a neoadjuvant study, but you're giving those neoantigens after the surgery. You are giving that tumor information to the immune system uh, versus traditional adjuvant studies where resection and a drug that doesn't really give any direct tumoral information to the immune system. So... This study actually looked at, so that's a schema of the study uh, that I just told, told you about, and the, some of the key eligibility criteria that these were very high risk for recurrence is melanoma. Uh, node positive, palpable, meaning you could feel the nodes or you could detect them on scans. Um, and uh, again, they needed to be cutaneous melanomas and no prior therapy um, had gone through surgery and so forth. And they were two to one randomized, meaning the, the vaccine with the pembrolizumab with two, two times as many patients versus the control arm with the primary endpoint of relapse-free survival with a secondary endpoint being uh, distance metastasis uh, survival, safety and tolerability of the therapy uh, in a follow-up of three-year period. So they screened 224 patients, and out of them, 150 were randomized, randomly assigned to either the treatment arm or the control. So there on the upper left is the patient demographics, fairly well balanced in both of the arms. And then you're on the right, you're seeing the benefit of combination uh, arm, which is better than pembrolizumab alone, meaning that if you take this approach where you design an mRNA vaccine, combine it with Keytruda or pembrolizumab, and you give that to patient, and their relapse-free is much better compared to pembrolizumab alone. On top, 
again, the theme is we have all these therapies. Are they easy to take? Are they safe to take? The toxicity profile in both arms were fairly similar. We didn't see any newer signals. So that's another great uh, sort of, you know, advantage for the patients. So what are we doing for the future? Um, there are new, so uh, one of the trials that just completed uh, is uh, nivolumab with rulatlumab that Dr. Moyers had talked about in metastatic settings showing benefit with PFS. Now we're looking at that particular combination in adjuvant setting, meaning after surgery, and that was completed and we're waiting for the results for it. This study by Mark MK7684A010, uh, this particular study is looking at high risk uh, melanomas that have been surgically removed and treating these patients with um, anti tigit antibody, which is MK7684A, uh, in combination with pembrolizumab versus pembrolizumab alone. Uh, this study is actively accruing and we look forward to um, its, its results in the future. All right, so this, uh, I think I have a few more minutes left and I'm gonna talk about neoadjuvant approach. So what is neoadjuvant approach versus adjuvant alone? On the top schematic, you see that a patient has a tumor and it's removed surgically, and then we treat it with immunotherapy in, that, in, in the sort of post-surgical setting. And in that setting, the amount of uh, tumor information, in a sense, the neoantigens, the, uh, the, our um, immune system's ability to identify tumor is limited because that tumor has been removed. It doesn't have access to that live tumor anymore. So as you can imagine, without that information, the immune system function may be slightly limited versus the, the depiction below where you're looking at an intact tumor within the body and you're giving a drug to allow the immune system to be active against. And now our immune active immune system has access to all that tumor information, these antigens, the ability to recognize these tumors and hopefully eradicate. So that's the preoperative or neoadjuvant approach. Okay, there have been a number of uh, different trials that have happened in this space. Um, and uh, I'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about them. So this is, um, you know, a, a sort of a number of different trials were put together and, and uh, the, that together data shows that if you take this approach, you treat these patients with a neoadjuvant or pre-surgically, and you can have their tumor respond, meaning decrease in size or completely go away. Those are the individuals that have the longest versus the ones uh, that don't have response to their tumor. So not only it matters that you give the drug pre-surgically, it also matters that that tumor responds to that therapy. So we'll talk about that. Um, there are a couple of terms that I'd like to define before we move further. There's the term PCR, pathological complete response, meaning that there's a tumor X located on the arm, for example, and we gave neoadjuvant immunotherapy, and then the patient goes for surgery. At the time, the surgeon removes the area where the tumor was or may still be, and then the pathologist looks under the microscope on that sample for any evidence for melanoma cells. If the pathologist finds no evidence or less than 10% of the whatever's left is the tumor cells, that is essentially complete pathological response. There is no more tumor left, meaning that's the highest sort of response you can imagine in that setting. But if there is still some tumor left and there's more tumor than, than you'd want, you know, that's a not pathological complete response those individuals don't do as well. So allows us to learn more and possibly add in therapies that would get them to sort of be in that relapse free survival uh, period as well. So Prado was one of the studies that it, with that intent to looking at 90 patients of 113 assessed for major pathological response, meaning 
at the time of pathological review, less than 10% of the residual melanoma was left in 60 patients, and 59 of them went on to get complete, uh, uh, they did not have any lymph node dissection. Uh, about eight had, sorry, 11 had partial uh, response that pathologically determined, and 19 had no response. Again, goes to say that the individuals who had major patho pathological response had not only they did well in the long run, they didn't require major surgeries. You could avoid some of these therapies. Um, and uh, so now we're talking about not only um, treating them up front prior to surgery, now we're also talking, can we limit the amount of therapy they require, but still keep them in the same benefit range that we've seen before. So a lot of new topics. Here you see that patients who had major pathological response, that's the green line up top. Those are the ones that continue to do better without any disease recurrences. The one pink line is the one that didn't have, they're sort of in the middle. They still have some amount of tumor left those do better than the ones that had a lot of tumor left. So the response really matters. So this is the probably one of the bigger child. This, con this child's sort of idea was slightly different than just neoadjuvant. What this child looked at <clears throat> was what's better? Is it treating with immunotherapy after surgery better or before surgery better? Right, and to address this, um, it's a SWOG study that looked at 345 patients and randomized 313 of them to either adjuvant arm or neoadjuvant arm, and then looked at their benefit. Uh, baseline characteristics are given on the right and fairly even. And here's the, the impact of this particular uh, approach that when you're looking at these patients, the primary endpoint of event-free survival was significantly better with the neoadjuvant approach rather than the adjuvant approach, okay? And there's also overall survival advantage with this approach. And you're not adding any new therapies. These are the patients that were gonna get pembrolizumab or another ad immunotherapy after surgery anyway. So why not give it first and have them do even better in the long run? So this is the other small study from MD Anderson actually published, uh, I think last year, looking at drug combination with nivolumab and rilatlimab. Okay, again, same concept, treating patients with high risk for recurrences disease upfront and then they had amazing responses, 70% um, complete responses. It's, I mean, these are numbers in melanoma that are unheard of. And on top of it, again, I keep coming back to the fact that not only that these are effective therapies, that these are tolerable therapies. So, so the future of, of uh, neoadjuvant approach is shifting almost daily. Like I said earlier, not only we want these tumors eradicated, we also want our patients to sort of live their normal life. I don't want them to be married to the clinic and coming here every three, four weeks for the infusion and be reminded they have a certain disease. I have that on their shoulder every single day, right? So this particular child is trying to accomplish that very much. Treat them up front, right? If they respond, if they have that pathological complete response, they will not need any additional adjuvant therapy. They're done, okay? I mean, when I don't think anybody thought that before, that you could just stop these therapies, that you don't have to. Like sometimes when we have these patients come in, even in advanced setting, they come in, they have complete response, PET scans negative after a year. It's like, okay, I think we can stop treatment. I think, but the society has built this idea that your cancer is only controlled if you continue to get therapy. We're changing that. And I, I, I get personally emotional about that. I don't know how you guys feel. I mean, to not, to tell somebody you don't need this anymore, you're doing okay, you're gonna be okay. And we have data to support that. 
Um, it's no words. Um, so the approach here, and, and we're also shifting. So what if somebody doesn't respond to neoadjuvant approach? I mean, the response rates are not 100%. So what do we do? Can we shift our gears? And this trial is allowing us to do that as well. If they don't have response the way we want them, and they have that VRAF mutation, we're allowed to change their immuno, uh, from immunotherapy to targeted therapy to see if we can keep them controlled like, to, to make sure that we can reduce the risk of recurrences. So these trials are the reasons why we're, we're able to shift these therapeutics. These are the trials that allow us to take people off therapy. And, and I'm glad that this center is here. I'm glad that we have patients who are willing to participate in these trials for us to move the therapies forward and, and benefit a bigger um, sort of, you know, patient population than just themselves. So this is uh, one of the other uh, Morpheus uh, neoadjuvant study uh, that's occurring fairly well. Key maker uh, UO2C that Justin Moyers uh, hinted towards, they have multiple arms looking at various combinations for neoadjuvant setting. And that's where I'll end my piece. Great talk. So, um... You can see all of the stuff that we learned in the metastatic setting we're bringing to patients earlier and earlier, trying to prevent recurrence, uh, trying to prevent toxicity, instead of having to do two years of therapy, possibly we can make it a year or even less. Uh, so a couple points to make as we move on. Um, one, uh, we have a huge amount of uh, people uh, zooming in. Um, and so for them and for you, if you have questions uh, and you're on the Zoom, put it in the chat. We'll get those at the end when we do question and answer. For those of you who are, who are here, uh, your packets have a, a note sheet, a note card. You can put the questions there. Um, uh, we will uh, move through and discuss multiple other parts of care for, for uh, melanoma. Obviously, we put up a lot of uh, figures and all. it's just so important to just get the, the gist of it, just the broad strokes. But if there's something that is not clear, we're going to answer you at the end. Uh, the, the number three thing here is Dr. Patel will be signing her New England Journal of Medicine <laughs> article. <laughs> at the end. Someone was like, why do you bring Sapna Patel and not have her talk about all of the stuff that she's done? Uh, because we're forward facing here. Uh, and when I, when I uh, talked to Sapna, who is a phenomenal friend, um, just amazing, uh, and I said, what do you want to talk about? She said, oh, no, I want to just, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about circulating tumor DNA. And, and I was, it was just like a moment like, yes, you're right. That's so important that in order for us to move on. We don't need to put a needle in you. We don't need to get a scan all the time. We don't need to, you know, we have other things now. And circulating tumor DNA is an amazing uh, tool. Uh, but I can't do it justice. So I'm gonna ask Dr. Patel to come up here. Thank you, thank you. I'm the shorty here. Let me see if I can lower it. Oh, <laughs> that's not the way to do it. Okay, well, it's, it's just gonna be in front of my brain. Okay, so. <laughs> clock here so I don't just keep rambling. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we are. So thank you all for uh, joining us here and for those online and for Dr. Hamid for this great title. I gave him the topic, but he certainly came up with this very charming title of liquid gold, which I think is right. I think that's what these kinds of um, liquid biopsies are. It's this one, right? The other one. This one. Okay. Okay. So disclosure.
factors. So when we talk about things like a circulating tumor DNA, circulating tumor cells, sometimes we refer to them as liquid biopsies. This is just to mean we don't necessarily need to take a tumor out. We can take some form of body fluid, maybe look for cancer there. And liquid biopsy historically has been, it started out looking for intact circulating tumor cells. So these are metastasis competent cells. These cells can extravasate and essentially start replicating and cause distant tumors. But you can also look for loose pieces of DNA we call that cell-free DNA, in which there will be secretion from a tumor of the tumor DNA, so circulating tumor DNA. And that can come from tumors that are replicating, but also from tumors that are dying and tumors that are um, essentially responding to treatment. What else do I want to tell you about liquid biopsies? There's other things you can do in liquid biopsies. You can look, um, you can certainly sequence them for these circulating tumor DNA mutations to identify a quantity of tumors, but you can also look for other um, methylations and epigenetic features of those uh, pieces of elements. There's things like exosomes, which are secreted small vesicles from cells. Um, for the purposes of this talk, we're going to just really focus on ctDNA and CTCs as liquid biopsy. The blood is not the only place, though, that you can get liquid biopsies. And relevant to a melanoma population, we can actually take the, the liquid part of the eye, the front part of the eye, and that's called the aqueous humor. And we can look for tumor DNA from uveal melanoma specimens. They've also done that for retinoblastoma, which is a pediatric cancer. And you can take the spinal fluid from a patient. And so a patient that might have brain metastasis or leptomeningeal disease, you can start to look for some of these liquid biopsy elements from that uh, body fluid. So in the metastatic setting, one of the easiest places to look um, for circulating tumor DNA was in our BRAF trials. So in COMBI-D and COMBI-MB, these were metastatic melanoma trials, one for um, non-brain metastasis uh, and one for brain metastasis. We actually had blood collected and banked on many of these patients along the way. And you could essentially do um, a sequencing to look for just the BRAF mutation. So if a patient has a BRAF mutation, are they shedding some of that BRAF into their blood? And it turned out there was a portion of patients who were shedding BRAF into their blood. And it seemed to indicate, um, it, it seemed to sort of trend with the proportion of patients who might respond. So patients who had a complete response, some of them were shedding, but as you can imagine, if you're completely responding to treatment, the BRAF might be going away. So it may be harder to detect, but partial responders and stable disease had detectable CT DNA. But this study was interested in something called zero conversion, which is four weeks on your treatment was your BRAF detection in the blood, was that actually going down? And zero conversion seemed to be associated with a portion of patients who were actually generating a complete or partial response. And then they looked at um, survival. So they said, what if we, you have some BRAF in your blood, maybe it, it will or will not predict your response, but will it predict survival? And so they made a cutoff of 64 parts of BRAF molecules per milliliter. And they said, if you had more than that in the bloodstream, it might impart that your tumor is slightly more aggressive. But if you had low 64 parts of BRAF detected, you might have an improved survival. And so they were able to essentially cut their data in half and say those above the median um, may be doing worse and maybe they need added therapy. That's, the, that's just the thinking, um, not that we acted on it in these studies. But we also looked at circulating tumor cells, so the intact metastasis competent cells. And here we looked in the adjuvant setting. So in patients whose melanoma had been completely removed, but had positive lymph nodes, was the detection of circulating tumor cells postoperatively problematic? And it turns out it was problematic if you had some CTCs um, detected, you didn't do as well as somebody who was post-operative and negative for CTCs. And actually we took it down by cancer stage. So if you had a uh, stage 3A 
versus 3B, 3C, 3D, and you can even extract, the, uh, extract this backwards to stage two disease, CTC positive um, patients after surgery don't seem to have as long a, a melanoma-free period as those who are CTC negative. This doesn't necessarily tell you how to treat a patient. We did a very similar analysis in the metastatic setting where we said, what about detecting CTCs in somebody who's metastatic? So these are intact tumor cells. And if somebody had one or more circulating tumor cell, even just one detected in a tube of blood, typically that indicated that their six months on treatment was gonna be, was gonna be marked by some form of cancer progression. So it's an interesting marker. It makes me think about things like the DreamSeq study, which was our um, immunotherapy versus targeted therapy and switch at progression study, where we know that there were a portion of patients, does this actually project? No, that there was a portion of patients who um, actually did pretty poorly up front on immunotherapy, never able to switch over to BRAF targeted therapy. If we had known that they had circulating tumor cells at the study entry, would we maybe have put them on the BRAF therapy first instead of immunotherapy, simply because uh, the immunotherapy patients, unfortunately, poorly early on, never made it long enough to switch over. So Checkmate 915 was the adjuvant study of um, nivolumab versus combination nevo -Ipi. So single versus double after the melanoma is removed. And this study essentially showed that there was no difference in these treatments, that the recurrence-free survival in the total study population and in the population of tumors that were pdl one low expressing, really no different. So maybe you don't need combination therapy, but one of the interesting biomarkers that they did was they looked at the association of post-operative but pre uh, drug therapy ctDNA, and essentially wanted to see if this again would stratify. So what they used was they used the resected tumors, and they made a tumor-informed signature. So each patient was having their own sixteen. It, this wasn't sixteen genes. Uh, they're having their own tumor-informed signature that they would then go look in the blood for those um, circulating tumor DNA pieces. What they found was there's a low prevalence in that post-operative pre-treatment specimen. But that's not surprising because the melanoma has been removed. You actually don't expect a lot of melanoma to be shedding in the blood, but recognize that you might test a hundred patients. You would only find circulating tumor DNA in about 16% of them. Interestingly, it also did not help you choose therapy. It did not segregate would a patient benefit from taking Nevo or the combination after surgery? So the presence of CTDNA is still not necessarily telling you what treatment to use. But when combined with other tumor features, it did say this is a group of patients who were likely to recur if you had positive CTDNA. So the simplistic um, analysis that you're able to conclude from that large study is that if you have post-operative CTDNA detection, that's the gold or the yellow curve, somehow, regardless of whichever treatment you took, you had a shorter melanoma-free period than if post-operatively you were CTDNA negative. And then again, this is not CTDNA for BRAF necessarily is tumor informed. So each patient had their own unique um, signature. Unfortunately, this still leaves us at a conundrum. It doesn't tell us who to treat. Uh, it, you could argue it tells you to treat the, the CTDNA positive patients. It doesn't tell you what to use to treat them. So we'll take a second here to look at a bladder cancer study. This was the Invigor 010 biomarker study. Their Invigor study was post-operative atezolizumab versus observation. And very much like the previous study, there was no difference. The group that was observed did just the same as the group that took uh, adjuvant atezolizumab. So overall, the study was negative. There was no difference in these two regimens. But then they went back and looked at, again, a tumor-informed patient signature. So here they used a... Um, a platform called the Natera Signatera assay, where they took those bladder tumors, they made, they looked for a fingerprint of 16 clonal variations in the DNA, and then they would go look for those clonal variations in the blood of those patients. So again, each patient had their own signature, but it was about 16 uh, genes. As long as they could find two of those variants in the blood, it was considered CTDNA positive. 
And interestingly here, if you actually separated ctDNA positivity from negativity, now you could start to predict who would benefit from a year of drug therapy. If you were ctDNA negative, it didn't matter what you, you could do observation or you could do drug therapy, the outcome was the same. But in those bottom curves, if you were ctDNA positive, you did better if you took the drug, the adjuvant atezolizumab. So here, this study actually does tell you which patient population to treat and perhaps what to do with them, not just observe, but give them an intervention. So we're still looking for that sort of replication in the melanoma space. So on the Signaterra website, they actually have a nice um, illustrative here of just when could you use something like a circulating tumor DNA slash circulating tumor cells, exosomes, et cetera. You could use it while the tumor is still in place. So you could use it to monitor response to neoadjuvant therapy. And in all of those previous neoadjuvant trials that you heard Dr. Memi talk about, you know, eventually, hopefully they'll start to be developed with this in mind. Maybe we start to check somebody's blood to see how they're responding to that treatment. And then you have circulating tumor DNA response, pathological response, and radiographic response to, to analyze. You can also use circulating tumor DNA or these liquid biopsies after surgery to determine is, does somebody have leftover disease? Actually, what that Invigor trial showed, and that's what that Checkmate 915 showed, there's a portion of patients who after surgery still have a little bit of cancer in their blood. And that may be the patient population that needs an intervention. For people who make it all the way down to zero, undetectable liquid biopsy after surgery, you could envision doing that at your annual checkup or your regular follow-up. And when that number starts to increase, when it goes from undetectable to some detectable amount, then you're actually detecting a microscopic recurrence. And maybe this is the time to, to intervene with therapy. And how early does that predate a radiographic relapse? And then another way to use it is certainly in the metastatic space. As somebody is metastatic, they're shedding more of these liquid biopsy elements into their blood. So maybe you could use liquid biopsy, which is essentially a simple blood draw in this case, to determine in advance of the scan or in parallel with the scan how treatment is working. So in melanoma, the Signaterra assay has been used in two different pilot studies with um, two different institutions. And in this one study from Moffitt Cancer Center, they looked at 73 different patients and they were able to get the clonal signature made on essentially 95% of those patients. And that's important to know because for these tumor informed, you have to actually have a quantity of tumor to be able to do this. In melanoma with small millimeter size primary tumors, sometimes that can be a problem to design some of these assays. But here they were able to do it. Now they're study had the early stage melanomas, cohort A, but then they also had a cohort of metastatic patients, which was cohort B. And then they had a small cohort of patients who had taken um, adjuvant PD-1 therapy and were essentially on surveillance. And so just looking at cohort A here, they looked at Again, patients had this clonal um, signature made. They looked in the blood for those clonal variants. And in six patients, they had a recurrence. This is patients with early stage melanoma resected. So they had a recurrence um, scan at some point during the follow-up period. And four of those recurrences were detected by ctDNA either before or at the time of their scan. And they looked at the um, distant metastasis-free survival in the group that was ctDNA positive versus those who were ctDNA negative. But with small numbers here, it's hard to necessarily assign statistics, but it looks like it was shorter for those who had detectable ctDNA post-operatively. And there's another study in this population of these early stage two, stage three from um, Huntsman Cancer Institute, where they looked at, again, doing the tumor informed signature from the resected surgical specimen. They had an 81% success rate, and the number might be lower because they had more of these early stage melanomas. The other um, institution used a few more metastatic cases in cohort B. But in this study, what they saw is there were a certain number of patients who post-operatively already had uh, detectable ctDNA. That's that far column on the left. 
actually that's pre-surgical, I should say. So they looked before surgery and after surgery. They actually found interestingly that the presence of pre-surgical CT DNA might be a bad omen. It's a little confusing though, because that's at a time when the tumor is still in place. And then they noted that in some of these recurrences that they had, the CT DNA did predate the recurrence. So the caution in interpreting all of the CT DNA data is that that BRAF data that I showed you at the very beginning, the com combi D and combi MB, that study suggests something like post-surgical or metastatic CT DNA levels um, might correlate with response and something like zero conversion does that amount of BRAF decrease might correspond with survival. The study that I just showed you suggested pre-surgical CT DNA might predict who's going to recur. And then both of those last two studies suggest that the presence of CT DNA or the occurrence of CT DNA postoperatively may predict disease recurrence in a portion of patients, but not all of them. And there's a list here in that last paper of all the um, CT DNA trials that have been going on for melanoma. This is, this is actually a, a kind of a rich field right now. So S1404 was one of the largest adjuvant PD-1 monotherapy trials. Um, at, essentially, it's the largest published uh, adjuvant PD-1 trial of single agent PD-1. Checkmate 915 is combination and bigger. This was adjuvant PD-1 versus adjuvant investigation which was at either interferon or ipilimumab. I wrote negative trial here. I really don't know why I wrote that. It's a positive trial. I think I was just tired when I did this. Pembrolizumab did improve recurrence-free survival. It did not improve overall survival, but that's the issue we have in the adjuvant setting. This is a positive trial. <laughs> But the issue that we did here is we looked at some of these tumors. This was mostly stage three melanoma. And we looked at those tumors and applied that same Signatera assay. And we said, how many times can you actually make the clonal signature? Well, that's about 80 some percent of the time. And how many times is it positive post-operatively? So at time point one, it was only positive in about 13% of our patients, which matches the Checkmate 915. 16% of those patients were positive post and that's tracks that, that makes sense at progression or recurrence. We had 23 recurrences in this roughly hundred patient pilot sub study to um, over half of those were CT DNA positive prior to, or at the time of recurrence, but it's not perfect, right? It's not hundred percent of the time that it predicts the recurrence. There's still 35% of patients who had a recurrence without CT DNA being positive. So we're still learning what to do with this information and what to do in um, melanoma. In uveal melanoma, melanoma of the eye, this is also being applied in the metastatic setting. So in the Tibentifusp uh, uveal melanoma trial, they actually looked at CT DNA in all patients who were able to give a blood sample at baseline and then at week nine. This is not tumor informed. This was essentially looking for um, the the common recurrent hotspot mutations in uveal melanoma. They actually found that the more that your CT DNA level dropped three, three cycles into treatment, the better your survival. On the right, I don't love the way this is graphed. This is actually a survival curve. This is not a Kaplan-Meier curve. It's more of an incidence. So if you had this much reduction, um, what was your uh, hazard ratio for survival? Here's the Kaplan-Meier curve for survival, which was essentially if you had more than a half log reduction, you had a better survival than if you had less decrease in your CT DNA. And on the right in blue, what you see is about a third of people had no reduction, about a third had less than a half log reduction, and about a third had more than a half log reduction. So we talked about CTCs versus CT DNA. CTCs are these whole cells. CT DNA are bits of loose DNA that come from a tumor. We also looked um, at MD Anderson at just CTC detection in uveal melanoma. So in patients were diagnosed, but had not yet metastasized. These, these are eight patients who were not metastatic. And actually we were able to pick up a CTC either at the time of progression or before the time of progression in 75% of these patients who ended up being followed. And uh, I won't take you through this one. That's not that important, but in 16 patients who have metastatic disease, we were looking to see if it tracked with, um, 
uh, status. And in some of these patients who started out with say five circulating tumor cells per tube of blood and increased to 48, that was a marker of their disease progression. And essentially we published this data. It's a little bit science of the obvious that static patients shed numerically less circulating tumor cells um, than metastatic patients, a difference of 1.83 tumor cells versus eight tumor cells per ml. Uh, per, per milliliter of blood. And if you had even one positive circulating tumor cell in the non-metastatic uveal melanoma cohort, these were the patients who essentially, um, it, it predicted for an, a recurrence uh, at some point. It's pretty obvious, but it was nice to actually look at it and see it. And then we also looked at CT DNA. So again, not tumor informed, we just sequenced for the most common um, genes that you can find in hotspot mutations. And we actually found a really nice concordance between the mutation that you find in the tumor and the mutation in the blood. Again, a little bit science of the obvious. Um, but we were also able to determine that the variable allelic frequency, the amount of tumor DNA that sheds goes up as these patients are progressing or develop metastasis. Um, this is actually probably not the slide set I meant to send you because I was going to tell you about our aqueous humor pilot study. In, in the interest of time, I won't go into it. And also our cerebral spinal fluid um, pilot study. So we're looking at these other body locations to look at this CTC, CT DNA. So this is my conclusion slide. It's a little busy, but that tells you there's a lot of work to be done still in this space. I think liquid biopsies are interesting, but they should still be considered exploratory. It would, if you're getting them done in clinic because certainly you're getting them offered and we can do them now out uh, through standard platforms, garden or foundation medicine, just recognize that there's still a lot of variability on how to interpret them and how to use them clinically. What do they mean? What does it mean when you're, when you're detecting something and then that changes, is it responding to, it's just a tube of blood, you know, like the, would the next tube of blood had the same, have the same amount of CT DNA in it or not. So um, just be careful if you're getting it drawn with the interpretation. You can use it postoperatively to see if your cancer has come back. You could use it to detect how well the, the um, uh, treatment is working. So like a surrogate for, for response to treatment. Um, you can use liquids other than just blood. You can certainly use pleural effusion, ascites fluid, aqueous humor, as we talked about, and cerebral spinal fluid. I think um, these tumor-informed signatures are really interesting, but the caveat in melanoma is that they won't fare as well as they do in the colon cancer trials and the bladder cancer trials because our tumors are millimeters. And in those diseases, it's centimeters worth of tumor that they can use to make these tumor-informed signatures. And in melanoma specifically, we have to reserve some of that tumor for BRAF testing. That, that has a therapeutic option. You don't want to use up all the tumor making a CT DNA panel. Um, and we would like to start to see some of the CT DNA that actually helps you decide which patient population to treat and which with which therapy. So that's really the end here. Thank you all. Thank you. All right. So uh, stuff, as you can see, it is the tip of the spear that uh, Dr. Patel is talking about. I'm going to pull this out. Uh, I would like to say two things. One, I'm going to steal all of your slides. So I'm getting permission. Said that like 52 times on your slide. <laughs> Number two, I think uh, I know circulating tumor DNA is going to make a huge change because it fits in with what else is happening in medicine. And that, that'll be my talk next year so that I'm ahead of you, AI in medicine. But AI is like big in everything these days. And you hear how it's going to replace pathologists and replace everyone. That's great. We can be, you know, having... Uh, drinks while we have AI give our talks next year, but it's truly the way to take all of this data and be able to segregate it uh, between tumors and utilize it to evaluate data that we get from everywhere. By the way, also I have, while you were up here, I have trademarked science of the obvious. Yes, I love that. I'm going to use that all the time. Um, and we can go from there. I got to do one thing as I introduce the next speaker, who's I bring all the time because he's not just a doctor, he's a psychologist. And when I bring him in, he 
helps my psyche. But, but also it's great. This is not good enough for him. He's taller than me. There we go. Uh, Dr. Sullivan and I, I met somewhere at some point and <laughs> I can never remember, but uh, as always, uh, you know, these meetings are are for all of us to get to know each other. We all have a connection in one way or another and to learn how to change our our therapies and how we take care of patients, even from the beginning. Um, we've made a major change here and in other places that as soon as you're diagnosed in, in post-surgery or early diagnosis, we do use circulating tumor DNA and move forward. Um, but at some point, that's not helpful. At some point, you've already seen your neoadjuvant and adjuvant approach. You've already gotten your first line of therapy, and you've, you've come here, and I've thrown everything at you, and you say, well, what's next? And that one, what's next is going to be um, expertly uh, introduced to you by Dr. Sullivan, who's assistant professor at uh, Harvard Medical School and at Mass General. And so I'm impressed and also very um, comforted in knowing that you're here and should talk to us. So come on up. So, so thank you very kindly for that introduction. Um, I once had a patient tell me that I was very soothing like Dr. Hamid just did. And I said, I was 185 pounds of Ativan. <laughs> that was 10 years ago. So I'm probably now 185 pounds of Ativan and 10 to 15 pounds of bad decisions. Um, however, it is a great pleasure to be here. And I look forward to talking to you about, um, again, a, a Hamid special uh, in terms of titles. I love it though. Clinical trial options, new data, future therapies. Um, here are my relevant disclosures. I have one more disclosure. I've been getting a lot of flack about the size of my phone and the color of my phone. And I have a small phone and it's red and I love it. So that's it. All right, let's talk a little bit now about melanoma. So we've heard lovely talks so far this morning describing a lot of the data that informs this uh, figure. So essentially, we've made a lot of progress in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, we have drugs in black that are the immune checkpoint inhibitors or immune therapies on some level. We have drugs in red that target BRAF. Um, and there are other diseases over the last 15 years that have had similar revolutions, but not many. Um, and I think the thing that's so amazing about this figure is the left side of the figure, which is so sparse, because essentially all the benefits of the 20th century in terms of therapy to treat cancer didn't help the great majority of melanoma patients, but yet the therapies that are helping patients um, with cancer in 2023 were actually originated uh, in melanoma, in our melanoma patients. So that's that's the, the backdrop to this slide, which is essentially, okay, we've had success. What else do we need to do? I think it's important to note that all the data that led to all the approvals of those now black um, words on the left side of the slide were obtained from patients who were treated right after they were diagnosed with metastatic disease. So that's not like they had something first and then went on those treatments. Some of the data involved some of that, but mostly it were patients who hadn't been treated before. And so the question in terms of an unmet need is, well, what do we do after we try one of those things? And it doesn't work because these drugs don't help everybody, unfortunately. And so I think one of the major unmet needs is what do we do second or third or fourth or fifth in patients after they've received all that stuff. Additionally, we need optimal treatment selection, and, and Dr. Patel talked a little bit about treatment selection, and we need better frontline therapies. I'm not going to talk a whole lot much more about that, but it's still an unmet need until we're curing almost everybody. There'll be an unmet need to improve our frontline treatments. 
And then third, we need better therapies for uveal, acral, and mucosal melanoma patients, patients who don't have the same benefit from those upfront therapies. Some do, but most don't. Um, and so we need better therapies. I'm not gonna talk a lot about that either. Oh, that's great. I love feedback, um, both from sort of the auditory feedback as well as if you have feedback about my talk, that's fine. If you like the jokes, great. If you don't, that's okay too. Um, although I don't like that feedback. Um, okay, so let's focus here. So I'm gonna break down the talk, essentially talking about unmet needs in two different ways. One, I'm gonna talk about targeted therapy. Um, and one, I'm gonna talk about very briefly new immune therapies. So we'll start with targeted therapy. So what is targeted therapy? Well, targeted therapy is in sort of a boiled down version in drugs, typically pills that focus very specifically on blocking what we call an oncogene. Gene is a gene that becomes a protein that drives tumor growth. Uh, these are uh, throughout all cancers. You can identify oncogenes. Some of the most common oncogenes in cancer are also the most common oncogenes in melanoma. Uh, RAF and specifically BRAF mutations, which turn on the gene and drive the cancer, are present in about half of patients with skin melanoma. NRAS mutations are present in about a quarter, and they tend not to overlap. So if you have a BRAF mutation, you probably won't have an NRAS mutation. If you have an NRAS mutation, you probably won't have a BRAF mutation. And what they do is they activate this pathway. And this pathway, when activated, is a whole bunch of including preventing cells from dying, helping cells evade the immune system, helping cells recruit new blood vessels, uh, and, and leading to, to cell growth. And most of the focus so far has been on blocking those mediators that are in that rectangle. I'm not going to show you any of the data. Um, I'm just going to summarize what B frontline BRAF inhibitor therapy does. Uh, we now have three combinations. I don't, I don't know why I put two fingers up. Three combinations of two drugs um, that are better than one drug. And that's BRAF and MEK. So if you kind of go back and you look at MEK and RAF, uh, so double blocking is better than single blocking. A subset of patients treated with these in the front line do amazingly well and are alive and their disease hasn't grown for five years eight years, 10 years. I still have two or three patients on the phase one trial of oncorafinib and binimetinib. We still have a few patients in our clinic from the phase one trial of debrafinib. Those trials launched in 2013 and 2010, respectively, at our institution. So these can be long lasting effects, but most patients don't have that benefit. Uh, we now have a prospective, we now have prospective randomized data. Dr. Patel showed it very quickly. Uh, from the DreamSeq study that suggests that immunotherapy is better than BRAF targeted therapy. We're talking about first, first line treatment. Uh, and we also have three trials that show that BRAF and MEK plus immune therapy is a little bit better than BRAF MEK combinations. But one of the three trials, only one of the three trials, was strong enough statistically to be positive. It led to an FDA approval of a regimen that not choose which is sad because it was like one of my best papers of all time. And I'll, okay. So what's, what does it mean now? Well, here's that little box is important because if a patient is treated with immune therapy first and it doesn't help them, there will be a role for targeted therapy in that patient and in every patient with metastatic BRAF mutant melanoma who's not cured with immune therapy. It's probably, it's not criminal, but it's sort of close to that. If a patient, there can be times where it, it just can't happen, but almost every patient with a BRAF mutation that hasn't benefited from immune therapy should receive BRAF targeted therapy. So this was alluded to by Dr. Patel and I alluded to it this time. I'm not gonna show the data, but I'm just gonna show you the schema of this trial. So this trial, the DreamSeq, randomized patients who are newly diagnosed with BRAF mutated melanoma to either get epilimumab nivolumab or to get debraf and abtrametinib. So combination immune therapy or combination BRAF targeted therapy. 
And then when they progress, they could go to the other thing. And so if you've got epinevo, you could get dabtram. If you got dabtram, you get epinevo. A positive trial at two years, you're way more likely to be alive, alive, not like alive without disease, alive, if you were randomized to epinevo than if you were randomized to dabrafenib tremetinib. But what's interesting, um, and so this is a plot just, it's a little weird, but it's showing response rates if you got arm A, which was immunotherapy first, arm B, which is targeted therapy first, arm C, which was the patients who switched to targeted therapy after they got immunotherapy, or ARMD was the reverse. The response rate for targeted therapy is quite similar whether you received it before, like it was as, as the front line, or if you received it as the second line, which is encouraging because it suggests that not only should everybody have a chance of getting it, but it actually might be about as effective. So the problem, however, with BRAF targeted therapy is that resistance happens. Um, and it happens in most patients, and a lot of mechanisms have been described. Um, one mechanism that we and others described was that the, the machinery to make a cell die can be co-opted, and that process can be prevented in cancer cells. So the way our body is, is, is all of our cells have the capability to just destruct. And it's a good thing that our cells can self-destruct because let's say that cell starts to become a cancer cell, we can self-destruct that cell and then we don't develop that cancer that we could have developed. Or we get infected with a bad virus or something, we can self-destruct those cells. And so that's a very important and healthy process of normal, we call it programmed cell death or apoptosis. And cancer generally does something to prevent that process from happening so that they can be immortalized. So we actually did a trial, uh, and Dr. Patel was part of this study, uh, where we looked at dabrafenib trametinib, so BRAFMEC in the Vitaclax, which blocks, or actually blocks some of the ways that the cancer might prevent apoptosis, which said another way, it can facilitate cell death. Um, and we looked at this, and we did a phase one trial, and we looked at a bunch of doses, and we identified a dose, and that was exciting. And then we did a randomized trial, uh, and this is sponsored by the, the, the NCI, the National Cancer Institute, uh, and our primary endpoints were like, we wanted to see, can this regimen better at reducing tumor quickly um, compared to dabrafenib alone? Um, and we had a bunch of other endpoints as well. And ultimately, this is going to be presented for the first time a month from now, not now. Um, but the the sort of in parentheses line is, it seems to work a little bit better in some patients and we're trying to figure out who those patients are. And so it's not gonna be the greatest thing ever, but it may help us lead to better approaches, more targeted approaches. Navitoclax has a few different things it blocks. Um, and there are other things that, that, that one of those three that it typically blocks might be more important than others. And so if we have a more specific inhibitor, we might actually have a better outcome. Okay. So the other thing that's, that's been tried time and time again is just hammering at this pathway. And so just sledgehammering RAF, sledgehammering MEC, sledgehammering ERK. And more recently, you notice how there's two different rafts up there. There's a red raft and then sort of a brown raft. And the brown raft, there's two of them. And the red raft, there's one of them. The red raft is how the mutated BRAF in melanoma signals. There's only one, turns on, and you only need one of them. In all of our other normal cells or in tumors that are driven above that, it actually does what's called a dimer. There's two rafts that put together. Um, and then that leads to signaling. And it turns out that you can develop BRAF inhibitors that are better at blocking one RAF or better at blocking the two RAF. And so there's emerging data with BRAF dimer, so two RAF inhibitors, or ERK inhibitors, which is downstream. So you can see the last sledgehammer is, is hammering ERK. The middle sledgehammer is, is hammering MEK. Um, and these are called waterfall plots. So down is good. 
up is bad. So down means the tumors are getting smaller, up means the tumors are getting bigger. Um, and now we have at least some data with ERK inhibitors and MEK inhibitors. We've had that for a while, but now we have data with a number of RAF dimer inhibitors that show improvement in melanoma and other cancers when in tumors that are driven by RAF or driven by RAS. And in the bottom there is an NRAS mutant population where there's two drugs, a RAF dimer and a MEK inhibitor. These are all the combinations of RAF dimer and MEK inhibitors that are, or ERK inhibitors that are making their way through clinical trials. And so it's, it's exciting that we're now finally finding drugs that seem better uh, at blocking that pathway and it may actually be useful in treating patients who have NRAS mutant melanoma, but also have BRAF mutant melanoma that's progressed after BRAF targeted therapy. Uh, this is uh, one such study that was presented uh, in Paris uh, back in September. Um, and what you can see is that big star in blue, that's the RAF inhibitor that was used in all the combinations, and that's called naparafinib. Um, and then <clears throat> there's a yellow star at MEC, and that the MEC inhibitor is called trametinib. There's a yellow star at ERK, and the ERK inhibitor is called hmm, rinaturkib, something like that. Uh, and then the, there's one on CDK4, and there's ribocyclic. Is that drug? That's actually a drug that's FDA approved for breast cancer. So this trial looked to, to combine um, the the RAF inhibitor with all of those others. Um, and what was shown was, if you look in the bottom right, BRAF mutated cancers didn't respond all that well. So these were patients who had been on BRAF inhibitors before. They went on this, and it didn't really help. Interestingly, there was data just presented a month ago at AACR with a different PANRAF inhibitor by itself, and it showed actually pretty good responses in that, which suggests that all RAF dimer inhibitors aren't created equal. They may have different ways of blocking the pathway so that it may be more effective for, say, NRAS mutant tumors, which if you look at the bottom right, all the way on the right, there's more down and more deeper down um, in, in those with all three of the combinations. Now, this is not without cost. Um, the drugs were paid for on the study, um, but the human price was in mostly rash. And almost every patient had a rash. Many patients had a bad rash. Um, and it got to the point where patients who were treated on this trial had to start pills to prevent a rash because the rash was so prevalent. Um, we think we can do better than that, and we're working on that in some of the newer studies. Uh, but it's it's certainly uh, it's one of the things that we have to overcome when we use these combinations. So to summarize the targeted therapy portion, then I just have probably a few minutes on the immunotherapy portion. There's a role for BRAF targeted therapy for every patient with BRAF mutant melanoma. Fortunately, some patients don't need it because they get immunotherapy and their disease doesn't come back. There's a better understanding of uh, BRAF mutant melanoma biology is leading to hopefully improved BRAF targeted therapies. And I talked a little bit about our Navidoclax study. And then there are new targeted therapy strategies emerging to treat BRAF, NRAS, and other oncogene-driven populations of melanoma, mostly focused on blocking that, that double RAF or RAF dimer. So in the last few minutes, I'll talk about new immunotherapies. So uh, you're going to hear more about this for sure from Dr. Memi. Uh, Tabentafusp is a drug that got FDA approved for uveal melanoma uh, in uh, January 2022. Um, it's a very interesting molecule. Uh, it looks a lot like a T-cell receptor. T-cell receptors are the part of the T-cell that recognizes stuff. Uh, and in this scenario, it recognizes a small little piece of a protein that's often present in melanoma cells. So it binds to that. On the other end of the molecule, it can attract in a T cell, and then it brings them together. And I like to think of this as like evil matchmaker. Um, it's good for the patient, but it's not so good for the cancer cell. Um, in any event, this drug works. Um, Dr. Patel showed you the data with the ctDNA from um, from the, the trial where patients had already been treated with something else. Uh, in the trial on the left, uh, these were patients who had been first treated. The first treatment for uveal melanoma was this. And actually, there's an even steeper reduction uh, in ctDNA. Um, we also, it's a weird drug. It doesn't lead to responses in most patients. 
but patients actually have benefit and by benefit, like they live longer uh, and they actually tolerate this quite well. And so treating beyond the scans looking bad uh, is something that, that probably can be helpful and trying to wonder, well, maybe we can use the ctDNA to do that. So why am I talking about uveal melanoma? Well, it turns out that our fearless leader, Dr. Hamid, um, and others have worked on this drug in patients with skin melanoma uh, and giving it in combination with other immune therapies. In this case, it was a pdl one inhibitor. Um, and what you can see, this is called a spider plot. Uh, and I mean, technically, it only should be a spider plot if there's eight patients on the arms, but no worries. Um, and so what you can see here is that, so down is good. That means their tumors are getting smaller. Long is even better because it means the tumors are getting smaller and staying smaller for a while. And I put that dotted line at 12 months. And so there's a significant number of patients that are surviving with control of disease after a year. And if you can see, there's two different colored lines. There's red lines and blue lines. The red lines are patients who had had PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibitors already. So those are patients who actually were resistant to the standard of care, and now they're getting treated, and, and some of those patients are having long-term control of their disease. So this is pretty exciting. It was so exciting that there's now a new clinical trial. We actually put the first patient on the trial in the world at MGH on Tuesday. Um, and this is a trial that's trying to build upon Dr. Hamid and others' data. Patients, um, arm A is tibentafusp, arm B is the combination, arm C is you can you're just being followed. And now why would they allow the control arm of a trial to just be followed? Well, again, the issue with this drug is that a lot of patients don't respond, uh, but still will have benefit. And so they're looking at uh, uh, the, that part of the study is looking at how long do patients live and they're comparing it. And so, so it's actually, you can do whatever you want with those patients. And actually what we're doing is we're rolling them onto a different clinical trial, which is totally allowable on this study. Um, now there's a twofold thing. And the reason I mentioned the ctDNA is once they get through the, the first part of the study, which ironically is called phase two, um, then they're going to look at all the data. And one of the things they're going to look at is, is the ctDNA going down. So it's not only is it have this novel thing about, we can treat patients on the control arm on another clinical trial, but the endpoint is novel. Our two is ctDNA going down. Is it going more with the combination of the anti-PD-1, in this case, it's pembrolizumab versus tibentafusp. Is it similar? Do we not need the anti-PD-1 arm? Do we, should we just get rid of the tibentafusp arm? Those decisions will be made as it transitions to the second part of the study, which is the phase three. Um, also in the phase three, patients who are randomized to the control arm will also be able to go on to other clinical trials. So it's a cool study. Well, what are we going to do? What other trials are we thinking about in patients that aren't going on to that trial? Well, this is, we're building upon a concept. The concept is that if you freeze tumors, you might augment a, an immune response. Uh, you might hear a little bit about radiation uh, augmenting immune responses, but freezing stuff also can do that too. Um, we previously did a trial where we looked at patients who were on a PD-1 inhibitor, their tumors were growing, and we put them on uh, this study where we uh, froze one growing lesion, continued their immune therapy, and then followed them out for a few cycles of, of, of treatment and scans. Um, and what we found, and this was led by Megan Meradian, who's one of our medical oncologists, Florian Fintelman, who's one of our radiologists who, who freezes stuff. Um, and we ultimately screened 20, 18 were like treated on protocol because two patients did amazingly well and, and didn't actually need the cryo. Um, and we had three patients who had responses. Now that's not amazing. We had another five that had control of their disease for a while. So that's a little bit better. Um, but again, all of these patients' tumors were growing. And what we identified is that if we actually freeze one of the tumors, very commonly the tumors get smaller but also patients could remain either in stable disease or in a partial response that lasted a while. And we're currently reanalyzing um, a lot of the tumor biopsies and blood, and hopefully we'll get this out soon as, as a publication. We're building on that. And now what we're doing is patients who re either receive PD-1 inhibitor or uh, nivolumab or latlamab, which you heard of, um, and then progress. We're gonna move straight to this, which is giving IPI and Nevo. 
and freezing the tumor, and then seeing if we get better outcomes there. So with that, um, again, this is the unmet need that we talked about, and I thank you for your attention. That's amazing. I think um, you're gonna live in my nightmares, breaking down a wall with that sledgehammer saying red wrath, red wrath, red wrath. <laughs> but true, there's a, a lot to go on here. Um, just amazing, uh, amazing stuff. And yes, uh, as we come to the break, I would say we we're gonna get back together around 11, 11.05. So there's coffee and all that stuff. Please uh, come right back because we have great talks. Thank you for uh, previewing the radiation therapy and melanoma talk. Dr. Shao will be doing that. And then ocular melanoma discussion. And then I get to speak too. So let's take a break and uh, we'll see each other back at uh, 11 to 11.05.
Thank 
Thank 
Uh, I want you to start. Oh, wait, wait, hold on. Yeah. 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 All right, we're going to get going again. Are we, are we okay? All right. So, uh, welcome back. Uh, welcome back to everyone who is also on Zoom. It's nice to see you. Um, as we move on, I just want to make sure that we don't 
forget the whole energy behind these meetings. And that comes from aim at melanoma and what they signify. Um, I think as physicians, we sort of are laser focused on treating patients that show up and want partners to help us to reduce the patient burden, educate the community, and support our care and our causes. And I have not worked with, I had not worked with a group until I started working with Val and Sam Guild and AIM at Melanoma. And not only did they support the work we were doing in the education, They've set a standard uh, for other foundations and other groups wanting to come and support, not just melanoma, but immunotherapy and other solid tumors. So I wanna make sure that uh, I introduce Sam Guild and give her the time to educate you the way she's educated me. Um, first, I want to thank the Angeles Clinic and Research Institute, Cedars, um, Connie, I don't know where Connie is, but um, everyone at the Angeles Clinic who really did a lot of work behind the scenes that without them, this would not be possible prior, you know, even the people who are here today helping out, um, of course, our panelists who have flown in, and all of you who are watching. Um, as you know, this is the 13th one. And so I think other than 2020, we've done this literally, we've done this every year. So the first one we did was in 2009. And well, uh, we have definitely have come a very, very long way. Um, so this foundation was started in memory of my sister who 20 years ago was diagnosed with stage four melanoma. She was 25. Um, she did not make it to 2004. And although we had, I just, so the first years we used to hold these events, we used to have probably close to 200 people in the room. I mean, that's how desperate people were um, at the time. And I mentioned earlier, this being a reunion, you kind of understand why, because we do this every single year. We have still about 200 people joining us, but many of them are live streaming in because they're living life. Right. I mean, that's why we are all here. It's why the people at the Angeles Clinic is why our panelists is why aim. We get up every morning. So even though we have a smaller group here, we're still as large. Probably this is one of the largest symposiums we have every year. It's because people are living. And although I love seeing your faces in person, I hope actually kind of next year where you're out living life and you don't need to be physically here. And so these events are more about staying informed than it is about trying to figure out what plan B, C, and D is going to be, because that's what it used to be like. And so, yes, this is a family reunion. And even though I don't get to see you in person every year, I don't have to worry necessarily why you're not here in person. I know you're here virtually or you're watching the recording because you're outliving your life. and. That is what makes these events with the Angelus Clinic the most wonderful experiences that I have as part of my job. But not every day is a great day. And unfortunately, there are still things that need to get done. And so there are things that we want to do to support all of you and the providers during your journey, during treatment, post-treatment even, um, and so these are some of the resources that we are providing. Um, I don't discuss the research work we're doing here because you're hearing lots about research. So I want to talk about the resources. So all of these treatments do have side effects. They are not pleasant, but we want to support you in recognizing and managing them so that you can have that quality of life that you need to stay on treatment. And so we have our side effects management guides. We have um, our PA, Melissa Wilson. Um, she has her own file following in and of herself, but you're certainly welcome to reach out to her to ask questions. She runs a webinar series called, I'm going to jump down to From the Clinic to the Living Room, 
We're actually doing one. It's Melanoma Awareness Month. So the one we're doing uh, this month is about melanoma on people of color. It's not a topic that is regularly addressed. And so we want to make a point of bringing it out. And so that's going to be this month's webinar. Um, she does one almost every couple of months. I'm going to jump back up. Uh, we talk about we have a melanoma clinical trials matching service. As you heard earlier, from day one, it's something to think about um, and to consider. And we have that service as well. Uh, we have Beyond the Clinic, Living Well with Melanoma. It's a podcast series with Dr. Ray Liu. There is more than just the physical aspect of having the disease. There's the psychosocial aspect of it. And he has a podcast every month. And we're so lucky that we um, have his assistance in that. Um, we have our Melanoma 101 videos. Those are more right now of an awareness videos, but we are coming out uh, very, very soon with videos about some of the treatments that are out there and some of the things to address. And of course, we always need hope, right? So we have melanoma survivor stories from people who are going through treatment, who are post-treatment and helping us um, through that journey. Um, we have our peer-to-peer -peer support program. Um, I can't give it justice to explain to you um, how successful it has been, but it is, it, you know, it's to help newly diagnosed people um, be supported by people who have gone through this journey, whether it's a patient or a caregiver. Um, we're always looking for mentors. So if you have moved on and want to support someone else, um, please feel free to reach out to us. But again, if you're newly diagnosed, we want to be there to help you as well. And then we have our uh, Steps Against Melanoma Walk. We're going to be holding one here um, in the fall. Um, we're actually doing one in San Diego later this month. We're in Dallas uh, today. We have a walk. Um, and that is support, that is to support our biggest research effort, and that is a, our fresh frozen primary tissue bank. Um, again, thank you so much. I kind of borrowed, um, so Ann Garst Taylor is our Director of Community Engagement Guru, so I borrowed her slides, but I do want you to know that even with my crazy busy schedule, you are always welcome to reach out to me. My email address is sguild at aimatmelanoma.org. Again, I've been involved in um, AIMIT for many years. I continue to be involved because of all of you. And I really want to encourage you to reach out if there's any way that I can support you during your journey. Thank you. All right. Now I get to talk. So um, as we go through this journey uh, for our patients and talk about adjuvant and metastatic therapies, et cetera, I, our talks became really keyed on BRAF therapies and checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, but in the back of our head, there was always the idea that there was more. There was stuff being done in small areas. Oh, there we go. Uh, in regards to T-cell therapies uh, and till adoptive T-cell therapies. And I, I'm amazed and impressed at how far we've come over the last couple of years with these therapies and how available they are. Again, I'm going to begin by saying uh, when you get another uh, another tool in your toolbox, you have to understand that it's just not there to be used later. We have to try and seek those answers. Who does better with one therapy over the other? Where does it fit in and where do we go? Because we're not just answering these questions for melanoma. We're again, as, as I've always said, answering them for other solid tumors. So these T-cell therapies, even though you're tuning in and you're a melanoma uh, person, yeah, these really do and will address other solid tumors, lung cancer, ovarian cancer, cervical cancer, et cetera. These are my uh, uh, disclosures for you. And the answer is always, look, it's in you. You know, what are we doing? A lot of this discussion has been that it's you, it's your immune systems that are fighting cancer because cancer is just a foreign invader, just like a virus is. 
just uh, like any infection is. And we have to take this beautiful T cell, uh, which is your immune fighter cell, and get it to the tumor, figure out why it's not working with the tumor. We know that it's not working because we have uh, we're targeting those checkpoint inhibitors, which uh, decrease the the activity of these T cells. And uh, we don't talk much about phar our pharmaceutical partners, but their understanding also. You can see here, these are the cell therapies that are coming through the clinic and they are increasing yearly. So it's not just one company, one person, one type of therapy. Uh, hopefully I'll take you through the gamut of these and talk more about MTAX. Uh, Immune mobilizing monoclonal T cell receptors against cancer. Dr. Sullivan began talking about them and the fact that it's a negative connection. I call them matchmaker uh, therapeutics. They're antibodies that at one side bring the T cell, on the other side, they bring it together to the tumor. As you can see here, uh, on the top, top right, you give this MTAC on the top, the T cell receptor targeting area on the bottom, uh, the one that uh, targets the, the tumor, and you give it, it brings, it connects the cancer cell to the T cell, and it's almost like a Yenta matchmaker. It makes a match that is toxic, and it, but it's appropriate. And this is the reason why we feel that some of our therapies fail to work is because you cannot get these two together. You know, it's, you can't get the tumor, uh, the T cells into the tumor. How can we do it? And these drugs are, are doing that. And uh, well, how are they doing it? Well, they're targeting these specific uh, antigens. You heard a lot about antigens. Dr. Memi started talking about them as far as, Neoantigens, these are novel proteins, neo novel antigens that are on tumor cells that don't belong there. And uh, as far as Tabentafus, we talked about that targets GP100. There are other drugs, so they're coming. There are broad based uh, base of them that are coming that are uh, specific for multiple different antigens. And this is the Prem drug made by the people who make tabentafus, but what does it do? It brings the tumor, uh, the T cells into the tumor, and it targets an antigen that's expressed on a multitude of cancers. I say, look there, it's high expression, that dark, rich, olive, green, melanoma, endometrial, lung, etc. Don't look at the numbers. If I show you numbers, don't look at the numbers. Look at the colors and and what I'm what we're trying to say, the broad strokes. Uh, this shows interferon gamma induction, like an if those are things uh, that's an interferon and uh, a stimulus that brings tumors, uh, T cells in and causes an inflamed environment. And on the left, you see one where you give the drug at higher doses, it causes interferon gamma to go up. In the peripheral blood, your T cells, like those blood tests that you take, they give you all these numbers and you don't understand any of it. You're like, well, I did my white cells are good and I'm not anemic, but uh, the lymphocyte count goes down in your blood. Why? Because it's trafficking. It's no longer in your blood. It's to the tumor. And that's what the those pic, those beautiful uh, pictures show. I was never really good at pathology, uh, which is okay because I, I may be out of a job because AI is going to replace pathologists. I hear, but you can see the CD three staining. That's the T cells. It goes up a huge increase as you give this drug, and and this is just the data from the Prame drug again. Dr. Sullivan educated all of us. If it's going down, it's 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 decreasing. Uh, so it works in uveal melanoma, cutaneous melanoma, ovarian cancers where we're seeing responses, lung cancers where we're beginning to see responses. And I didn't put it up there. It's always good to put up an X uh, scans. You can see on the top baseline on the bottom after some initial therapy shrinkage. This is one of our patients who was treated with what was standard, anti-CTLA-4, multiple anti-PD-1s, multiple injectables, and then came and said, I don't have another, I don't have another option. And we gave her this, this therapy and it and it helped. 
And we now, when patients come, we screen them for whether they need to be on this therapy and go forward. If you come to see me, part of your therapy, or if you see Dr. Sullivan, uh, Dr. Patel, Dr. Matt, part of it is I need to get your tumor genotyped. I need to get circulating tumor DNA. And I may need to check you for the type of patients who are appropriate for this therapy. You've seen this, but I'm going to take another part of this. This not only showed that it works in cutaneous skin, skin melanomas and ocular eye melanomas, but it also showed that it's very tolerable with not just an anti-PD-1 approach, but an anti-CTLA-4. So you can, triplet combinations do work here. And it, it's a different therapy. So you can see how you can prime by giving this drug, bringing the T cells in and boost by giving a checkpoint inhibitor to allow the immune cells to remain active once they get in there. You just saw this in a better fashion. So it's coming in melanoma. One of the interesting thoughts here, and this is from Dr. Carvajal, who is great uh, in melanoma and is now leading a, uh, a, a huge cancer center. Uh, but this is a patient, you don't need to read all that, ovarian cancer, received uh, all of the checkpoint, in, I'm sorry, not ovarian, ocular melanoma, received all of the therapies, didn't do well, came on to uh, uh, one of these uh, IMTACs, which was Tabentifus, and then had some benefit, it stopped benefiting them. And then they went back on to drugs that they had seen before and had a great response that's durable. Why? Because probably initially this person didn't have those T cells in the right area. And then you got the T cells in and then you came back with the checkpoint inhibitor and it worked. This is amazing. Yes, it's crazy that this works, but it's proof of principle. And it shows... The one thing that the power is really in you. This one patient's experience informed us more than a 30, 50, 60 pa patient trial. It informed us on how to move forward. So look at all this prior therapies. So, I mean, and then did well after that. So I steal that from him. And this only says that we are not done exploring combinations with these T-cell therapies. This trial is open at a place near you. And it's not just, you could get a lot from here. So we're looking at it in ovarian, endometrial, non-sponsored lung cancer, now triple negative breast cancers, uh, in sarcomas, and not just in single agent, but there are expansion cohorts with chemotherapies, expansions with anti-PD-1 therapies, and combinations of these MTACs. So there's an arm there for ocular melanoma patients to not just get this PRAME agent, but to get the approved agent to Bantafus. And we can see how we're mimicking what we've done before get one drug that works, a similar drug from the same class, see if they work together, see if they work with everything else, and then we're moving forward. Now, a lot of hubbub is coming from adoptive T-cell therapy. When I used to talk about therapies for metastatic cancer, I used to only spend one slide on it because I couldn't do it. I didn't want to talk about therapies that I didn't give and I didn't do, and it was hard to get access to them. Uh, and, and now... I told you I wouldn't show you a lot of numbers, but this is uh, second line post the initial therapies. Now these TIL therapies are showing the highest response rates after initial checkpoint inhibitor. That's all you need to take from. How does it work? Well, you, let's say you show up here uh, or anywhere else, you need a, a surgeon. So if uh, you showed up at... MD Anderson, Dr. Patel would introduce you to Merrick Ross, lovely guy. If you showed up at uh, Mass General, Dr. Sullivan would uh, introduce you to Dr. Boland. She does your surgeries. And if you came here, you would be introduced uh, to Dr. Ferries and the patient, you know, those are areas of tumor. They get a surgical removal of the melanoma and they digest that melanoma easily, simply put, just like we talked about utilizing the T cells that are in your initial tumor in a neoadjuvant approach, this takes that out and brings those tumors that are already there, that are specific for your cancer, 
And it expands them. Why? Because we may not be enough cells. We may not have enough of the T cells. You may need to, you may need to staff that tumor with more of these T cells. They expand them. And this is the part where we couldn't really do it because we didn't have the the labs to do it, the clean rooms and the staff, et cetera. Now our pharmaceutical partners are doing this, you know, locally. So Ferries does the surgery, sends the tissue off, and this is done in Philly. Uh, so Iovance is a company that we work with that's doing this. It's an interesting place they do it. It's very lovely if you ever get to go there. It's across the street from the spectrum. So you can go see their facilities and catch a 76ers game. But then they send it back to us. The patient gets an, a, a regimen that gets rid of their T cells that are non-specific for the tumor. They get the infusion of the till in the hospital, and then those T cells are agitated to get into the tumor with IL-2. And so once they're infused, they get into the circulation, they migrate, they recognize the antigens in the tumor because they were specific for the antigens in the tumor, and they cause lysis, which is just a good word for death. And I don't like to show icky pictures, but this icky picture shows what can be done, you know, just, uh, you know, and continue to be done. You can see the most impressive part is what happens months and mo months past because this is a one-time therapy, one-time therapy. You don't have to come back for it. You don't have to, but our trials are looking at how to do it centrally. This is the trial that did it centrally. This is the trial that showed that places that are as small as ours, because never would I get in front of you and say that we're as big as Mass General, Harvard, or as big as MD Anderson. If people were paying attention, uh, Dr. Patel's huge, huge uh, first slide showed this place. And I was like, is that Disneyland? It's so huge and beautiful and well lit. It's a, but it's just MD Anderson. It's huge. But places like us, we could do it. And this means that anybody can do it in any center in any state. Um, as an aside, cohort three uh, looked at retreatment and we'll see if we can retreat. Uh, these are swimmer spots that just show that you can get early response and they're durable. Just pay attention to the bottom. It's just not. And you can see the power of the therapy months after you've given one therapy. Uh, this is interesting because it shows, it's a lot to read, but it shows that it works in patients whose initial response to the standard therapy was no response, okay? So you can give the same types of therapies, but you may get the same results and you may not be going down the right path. And this indicates that if you're not getting a great result, you know, at the first pass with what's standard, you may need to go to another approach. Um, well, what about earlier and earlier and earlier? This is done, uh, this is John Hannon's data and it was presented uh, at ESMO, but published in the New England Journal of Medicine same as where Dr. Patel's data was the, the highest journal of the land. And this looked at something different than what I showed you before. Before it was, they'd seen the BRAF targeted therapies and the average number of uh, regimens the patients had seen was somewhere around three to five. This is right after just seeing PD-1. So patients were randomized to going on to the CTLA-4 drug you heard about, which would be a standard second line versus going into TIL therapy. And what they saw, and you just need to take a look at the response numbers, 41 versus 18%. So a higher percentage of patients responded. A clinical benefit is not just responded in shrinkage, but staying stable or uh, all those patients that were going under the waterfall plots and still higher, 57 versus 33%. And progression-free survival. How long did that hold how long did that hold the patients from needing another therapy or having growth? And the red is the adoptive T-cell therapy. The blue is going on to NTCTLA4. And much better, of course, and you're starting to see a plateau that maybe those patients who were much, 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 many months out, like 84 months out, they'll never need something else again. So that's the promise of this therapy. While this was a small trial, it did show us that we can bring it earlier. We didn't spend a lot of time and don't really spend a lot of time talking about brain metastases 
because we know now that these therapies get to the brain, which was a place where we were really without any type of therapy in the past. This is data showing that this adoptive T-cell, this cell therapy gets into the brain. And just the push to say that clinical trials are also looking for it. This is Allison Betoff Warner, who is now at Stanford. And she has a trial looking at patients with live brain meds, like that haven't been treated, looking at how TIL works for them. Well, what about earlier and earlier? This is a lovely trial that's been presented as ongoing, looking at first line when you're first diagnosed, what if I give you a checkpoint inhibitor, this PD-1 drugs that we've been talking about, which is the standard backbone along with TIL. And again, so thank you so much for teaching everyone how to use, how to look at a waterfall plot, because this is extremely, extremely promising, a small numbers of patients, but nearly all patients with melanoma had an initial benefit. It all go down, all goes down. And then it stands to push the idea that these are not just for melanoma. The second group are head and neck cancer patients. And the third group are cervical cancer patients. And I wouldn't sit here and tell you that melanoma is unimportant, but I would say the idea of finding something for cervical cancer globally is a huge problem. And look at how well this works. We're now accruing to this trial, which is knocking out PD-1. P the PD-1 inhibitors try to block PD-1 on the, on, the, on the T cells. This knocks out through CRISPRing I'm just going to use a buzzword CRISPR and just get takes out. So these cells don't express PD-1. So you can just give this till alone. And now that's looking at unresectable metastatic melanoma, but also non-small cell lung cancer, another place where we have problems with getting benefit. Preclinically, this shows that it is working better than others. Uh, what about a smart T cell? How can we make T cells smarter? Uh, and this is a trial, actually, it's running at MD Anderson uh, of a drug from Obsidian. Uh, it, the cell ex itself expresses interleukin-15. There's another interleukin. Interleukin stimulate the immune system so that you don't have to give I interleukin-2 in the hospital infusionally. It has a linker right here. And by, and by giving a, a pill, you can cause the expression of IL-15. If you run into side effects, then you can stop giving the pill and you don't have those side effects. So that's wonderful. So that's TIL. What about CAR-T? You hear that because uh, our friends in liquid tumors like lymphomas and leukemias have benefited this. It's like putting a honing mechanism in the T cell. You don't need a surgery here. So uh, Dr. Ferries doesn't need to be here for me. The patients go and get an apheresis, uh, just in the place where you donate blood. And instead of taking your red cells, they take your T cells out. It goes into a lab where they transduce, which means they just place in it. They modify the T cells to have a, a heat, like a heat seeking missile, to have an antibody that targets a specific protein on the cell. Um, heat seeking, uh, just like I talked to you about the MTAX, where it has an antibody that takes you to the tumor and an antibody that brings the T cell in. Now you don't need that, that part that brings the T cell in. The T cell itself goes directly there and has to go directly there. It's like when I tell my son, you got to go meet this woman's daughter, because you two are going to get married in 15, 20 years, directly focused, don't look anywhere else. And they, exp they expand it the same way they do for till. And then you get the chemotherapy, the infusion and go forward. Um, this is a trial running out of you that has uh, finished and accrued out of UCLA there. And you can target specific proteins. This is the Amantix drug, which does the same thing, but it targets prime. Just like I talked to you about the impact of targets prime, these T cells target prime, and you can see that it causes shrinkage of tumors. I'm not much for the radiology. Oh, well, what, why, why is it so important? Because it's proof of principle uh, that you can use these <clears throat> drugs 
in other settings. And this is not a melanoma. It's another solid tumor, but this was presented and I really loved it. They took the CAR T cells and instead of infusing them centrally, like giving it as an IV and it goes throughout your body, they give it directly in, into the brain. And you can see some of that stuff around the spine just begin to melt away. So these are the futures of these therapies. And I'll spend a little bit of time uh, talking about NK cells. These are natural killer cells. There are other cells that your body have that attack tumors. There's a phenomenal person at MD Anderson, uh, who's at MD Anderson, Persian like me, and the lab is looking at how to utilize these NK cells, not just her, her name, Kathy Rizvani, uh, but her company and other pharmaceutical companies are looking forward to bringing this NK cell therapy. It's great, I'm gonna show you single agent, but I think in the future, what's gonna happen is, these are going to be given into the central nervous system. These are going to be given along with PD-1 inhibitors. These are going to be given along with TILs. And you're going to come and we're going to take, at the beginning of diagnosis, take your tumor and do these things for you and have these things available uh, for all patients. What's so great about them is that these cells, uh, these NK cells, don't really need to come from you. Allo NK comes from another patient uh, is being looked at. They're looking at decreasing the need for lymphodepletion. So you don't need to get the chemo to get rid of the other T cells. Uh, so you can have this off the shelf. So <clears throat> if someone doesn't do well with the initial therapy and they say, oh, great. Now I got to go see fairies. He's on the second floor here. Then I got to wait until my tills are made. You can say, all right, while well, you see fairies, this is off the shelf. I got it. It's in here tomorrow. Get your surgery, heal, come and you can get this. Uh, and <clears throat> interestingly, uh, we've seen it work. And we've seen it work in cancers that really don't respond to other any other types of immunotherapies. And we've seen it work in cancers that have failed initial PD-1 therapies. Uh, this is uh, NK Gen, uh, NKGen's data. Uh, I think it's a uh, auto NK, but it's NK cell therapy. These are patients. These are patients that really don't respond that have failed standard therapies. And we you can see here that in these patients, they have response and durable response. So proof of principle is great. I love this slide because it helps do three different things. One, it shows the future. Uh, two, it helps as I uh, come to the end and have to introduce the next speaker. The uh, gentleman who's the chief medical officer here is a radiation oncologist that I knew very well who worked in the community and then believed in this so much and started to work with this company and is now bringing this drug, not only to patients with other solid tumors, but with mel to melanoma and will be opening hopefully their trials soon. You can see the sarcoma patient went through chemo, 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 and also Keytruda PD-1 therapy and didn't work. And now the amount of a benefit from this therapy is visible. And there are trials looking at it from metastatic to the melanoma, metastatic to the brain coming, HER2 positive glioblastoma. So even brain tumors they're looking at it for. And also complexing. This comes from God, MD Anderson Cancer Center. They, but this comes from the Rizvani lab. And it is uh, uh, complexing Allo, that means from someone else, NK cells with bispecific cell engagers, which are IMTACs, putting them together and then putting them in your body. So not only are you getting the NK, but you're getting these bispecifics together. And this has been shown to really work in other solid tumors. So in conclusion, we're working towards improved survival. Not only are there different pathways that Dr. Sullivan showed you, like Red Urk, Red Raff, Red Raff, <laughs> red raff Brown Raff, Raff Raff, but that whole pathway, Raff, Raff, Rack, Eck, Burk, 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 but many new pathways immunologically. So these, these two concepts are coming together. 
There are new standards in the first line, second line options are expanding, brain metastasis options, and they all come through clinical trials. So if someone says, why clinical trials? Well, because the benefits can come earlier. And the other point that I really always say, I need to make this point, but I fail to make, is we're moving so quickly that, and the survival for metastatic melanoma has increased so much that you can be diagnosed, go through your first line therapy. There could be a trial that's accruing at the same time. And when you need it, that trial has already accrued, already data, already has the availability of it for you. And that's the new paradigm. How quickly we can get these things into the clinic to our patients. It was not like that when all my hair was black. It just was not. And now it is. So with that, I think I've introduced you to the T-cell and I can end, oh, I forgot, imaging. We can now also image to see if these cells are going to the right place. And all of you know how to do a PET scan, but these are PET tracers that don't target tumor, they target the T-cell. So you can begin, get a PET, see where your T-cells are. Oh, they're not in the right place. I need to target with T-cell therapy. And then give those T-cells or give the PD-1 therapy and then say, hey, let me get a scan at like two to four months and see if they're there. If they're not there, you got to go to something else. And it may be better than, or it may be able to augment circulating tumor DNA and things like that. And with that, I'll thank you. And I'll use this opportunity to say, when I talked about the NK stuff, I said it helps me bring a couple of thoughts together. And uh, the lovely Paul Song, who is that radiation oncologist I worked with in the community, I once went and visited him and noticed that he had a new desk in his office, which was weird. Paul's a very important guy. Sometimes those people need two desks. But I asked him, what's that desk for? And he said, that desk is for Stephen Shaw. And Stephen is a revelation for us and our patients because he really does understand immunotherapy as it relates to the utilization of radiation and focal therapies. And that's important. That field is expanding exponentially, how to give it, when to give it, and where to give it. So with that, I'll uh, bring Dr. Shao, who's from the Department of Radiation Oncology at Cedar sinai and a great colleague. Um, thank you, everyone. And thanks um, to Omid for um, introducing me and for inviting me to give this talk. Um, it's always hard to follow such excellent speakers. So, um, um, but uh, so I'm going to tell you something um, a little bit different. Um, so, um, so uh, basically, um, as many of you know, radiation is um, in uh, a, a well, a well, a familiar, I should say, cancer treatment. But I think what is not well known has been that we've kind of re-revolutionized really our understanding, both in terms of how we can deliver radiation in more focused and better ways to limit toxicity, but also um, the biology of radiation, which is something, you know, my laboratory studies, but I think as radiation oncologists, we're very interested in understanding the immunobiology of how radiation can integrate with some of these amazing kind of new therapies that are coming online over the last couple of years. And so, um, Here's my disclosures, just so. Um, and then, um, so basically, I'm just going to start by talking about some of our current applications in melanoma. Um, you know, we do have a role as kind of one of the uh, traditional pillars of cancer treatment. Um, so, um, but I would say that, you know, we've had a, a tough history with melanoma in some ways. Um, and one of the reasons is because uh, historically, melanomas have been perceived to be very resistant to radiation. And that's um, sort of absolutely true. So one of the ways we used to give radiation, and we still do to some extent in some diseases, is to give a little bit of radiation at a time. Like you give it to like a large area and you give a little bit at a time. And the reason we did that was because it's safer to give a little bit at a time so your body can recover from each dose of radiation. And so, but because of uh, the intrinsic biology of melanoma, so um, as many of you know, they're um, highly resistant to sort of reactive oxygen species, which is sort of how, um, how radiation actually works 
works is by generating reactive oxygen species that kill tumor cells. Um, because melanomas are highly resistant to that, they were always resistant to maybe low doses of radiation. And so um, one of the things that's happened over the last uh, um, maybe 10 years or so has been um, a revolution in how we both deliver and plan radiation. So radiation, uh, you know, we are one of the first uh, fields in medicine to actually take advantage of AI. So we were the first to have such advanced um, computational skills. And the reason we needed that was because we were able to now, um, we have computers that are connected to our machines that essentially can shape the beams however we want. And so you can see here, I'll give you some examples of very focused radiation. And these, um, the kind of center parts are very hot and then the kind of rest of the body is, is pretty cold. And so we can do everything from multiple brain mets, which you can see there, as well as small different tumors all throughout the body. And so why does this really matter? And the reason why it matters is because one of the things that we've known for a long time in melanoma has been that if you can give a higher dose per day, um, essentially, um, you can also then you can control the melanomas better. And so um, and to some extent, you can control individual tumors um, quite well. And so this precision allows us to deliver the dose in ever increasing doses, you know, safely. And so now it's become less of a question of how much dose do we give in some sense but more um, where do we give it and when do we give it? And so, um, so where we give, so just to give us a background of where we start, this is where radiation is sort of used right now. Um, you know, of course, as you know, so we're a local treatment modality in many ways, and that's kind of where we've been historically. And so um, surgery is the first. So when you get a melanoma, you do surgery. And then, um, but sometimes um, the surgery, um, despite um, our surgeon's best efforts, and they're all amazing, you know, don't get everything, or there are um, microscopic disease questions that are left behind. So so we um, sometimes do it to the tumor bed to try and increase um, uh, our control rates for local disease. And then also sometimes um, when there's a lot of nodal disease. So we I give you all these criteria here, but the fact is, is just um, you know when there's bulky disease in the nodes, radiation can do, um, even though they take them out, we can do a pretty good job controlling the uh, microscopic disease. And so... Um, other common indications, just um, so um, uh, many of you might know, so radiation still remains, um, you know, about half our patients are palliative, um, but we give different kinds of dosing now. So for melanomas, especially, um, you know, we we do lots of different brain or visceral metastases and so a lot higher. And so, um, but we often use radio surgery in that approach. So different from a lot of other diseases that we treat, we melanomas, we treat specially because we give them different kinds of doses, which are shorter, but bigger in each dose. And then um, a, another one that we've kind of moved into, and this is something that gets into this therapy, sort of, can we do definitive treatment? And so because we can give such precise dosing, for some melanomas, we actually do, you can do radiation alone, but obviously surgery remains the primary one. These are for patients who really couldn't undergo surgery. But, um, but really we're trying to think about, so we've, we've been doing radiation for melanomas for a long time and we have a lot of options to do that. Um, but um, so I was, when, uh, when Dr. Hamid invited me to give some thoughts about where we're going with radiation in melanoma space, I kind of came across or thought about kind of two ideas. And then one is this idea, which sort of takes advantage of this concept of uh, being able to control disease locally. And it's the idea of oligometastatic disease. So oligometastatic disease is something that we've kind of known about, and it's sort of a thing that's been batted around, but it's really important for radiation oncologists because one of the things that we can do now is we can kind of target anywhere in the body, right? And so our question has been, well, where do we target or what do we target? And so um, we do have some physical limits, right? So sometimes, as many of you know, met metastases and some of the pictures we've seen today are like, you know, just too much, right? And so we, we can't do that. But there's a really narrow window sort of in between that space where patients have uh, limited amounts of disease, something we call oligometastatic disease. And that's something we think of as um, in, you know, for lack of a better thing, we just counted them. You know, we think of them as like five or less metastases. The number is very fluid. And I think it depends on sort of where they are and kind of things like that. But for, for these purposes, we think of a limited number, somewhere between like five to 10. And so 
um, because we're able to deliver doses that can control this disease, we wanted to ask questions about, okay, well, so does that even matter, right? And so we have randomized trials in which um, this is one where we've done uh, multiple kinds of disease. So these are patients um, from lots of different disease sites, uh, many of whom have failed their multiple lines of treatment. So you've seen patients undergo many, many lines of treatment, but yet their, their treatment, or they might be partially working in which case, um, but they still have a few sites that are growing. And so we took patients that had about five of these different sites and we randomized them to either treating everything or just doing palliative, meaning, you know, if, if there was, there was something uncomfortable or um, it was causing pain. And so you could still get a little bit of radiation, but you wouldn't kind of go all out. So we treat essentially treating metastases that aren't symptomatic um, to try and ablate them. And in fact, what was really interesting about this, um, you know, obviously there's breast, colorectal lung, but there's some other, and of that other, a few of these patients were melanoma. Um, you can see that in fact, what surprised us all was that in fact, um, there was an improvement in survival. And so not only did it um, improve progression-free survival, which we would have expected because we're treating um, disease that is uh, progressing, but it also improved overall survival. And so, you know, we think that, um, you know, in many ways being aggressive in this space, you know, is a way for us to kind of think about patients in a new light, that you do have metastatic disease as a patient, but, but it's possible that we can control it. And in some situations here, you can see you could control it for quite some time. And so, um, uh, so when we think about it that way, then we also think about, um, so when can we apply this? So of course, um, there are lots of different situations of oligometastatic disease. There's sort of the upfront oligometastatic disease. So patients who are initially diagnosed with metastatic melanoma where, who have an, a limited number of metastases. So obviously, um, my colleagues in oncology, they have a, a far, uh, <laughs> they have first dibs on that. But the question will be, you know, are there, what if there are things that don't respond or things that are not responding completely? Is that, um, is that a time in which we can do um, radiation? And then something we've been doing with Dr. Hamid has been, you know, what if you're controlling disease on your current regimen very well? But as the question that Dr. Sullivan brought up, well, what's the next step? You know, we don't know what the next step is, but sometimes maybe the next step is you should stay on what's working and we should take care of some of the bits that aren't working, right? And we can do that now. And so we asked, um, you know, could radiation, you know, in some ways be a treatment line? And so um, you know, we've looked at this and we've done a retrospective review. And so this admittedly, so retrospective data is sort of our weakest kind of data, right? So it's data where we've kind of looked back at patients and we treated them a certain way, but they're not uh, randomized. So, you know, obviously this is a great, you have to take this with a grain of salt. But, um, but when you look back at patients who have oligometastatic disease, or oligoprogressive disease, and you see them and you treat them at that time, you can see that if you follow them out, many patients have long-term control. So um, in the oligoprogressive state, even, even though it's obviously not as good as when you're upfront, um, you know, treating them all, the oligoprogressive patients still do really well in the sense that, you know, almost 60% of them three, three years later are still kind of going strong. So, you know, this could be a strategy in which we think about that. And so, you know, so when we think about um, sort of what are some of the next things that we do, this is like clinically applicable now in the sense that, you know, we refer to oligometastatic states. And so we look for these patients. And so when we're in tumor board or when we have patients, um, sometimes we remind our medical oncology colleagues, if we have patients who have a meaningful number of metastases that are doing well on their current treatment, but we can treat them, we need to find them and be aggressive about it. So even though patients are not symptomatic or things are um, otherwise going pretty well, you know, we, the earlier we can do it, not only are they smaller, so they're safer for radiation and for radio surgery, but also, um, you know, we can control that for the long term. So um, finally, I think this is the one that everybody's kind of most interested in. This is something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, I'm an immunologist by training. Um, so I'm um, in my lab studies immunology. So we do a lot of immunotherapy. And so, um, you know, this has been something that we've been kind of thinking about, um, you know, for, for a long time. And we've been trying to figure out, and part of it is because from this paper, which is one of the earliest papers that we've seen this from one of our colleagues at Memorial, Michael Postow. And, um, and basically this is just a single case report, um, but what's really intriguing about it, and this is like um, proof of concept as Dr. Hamid would say, you know, is that um, this proof of principle is that essentially this is a patient who had been on ipilimumab and, um, and was uh, then subsequently failed. So you can see there's lots of different sites of disease um, uh, here. There's like in the spleen and in the lung, but 
But um, what we did is that um, this patient then went on to receive um, uh, a specific kind of dose of radiation. So this high dose radiation just to the lung lesion. So none of the other lesions. And this patient that was no longer responding to ipilimumab suddenly re-responded. So this question of resistance or how we develop it sometimes might be able to be abrogated by radiations. And that this is the proof of concept for that. And so, um, you know, we've been looking at it. Um, so here's some work from our lab, but also from um, other places where we've looked at um, not only mouse models where we've seen that, um, you know, when you treat um, with radiation, that radiation is sort of an immune event. So we know that radiation actually integrates well with immunity. And also you can see here that um, uh, melanomas from patients, you can see that when they're um, immunosuppressed, they don't do very well, even with radiation. And so we, that kind of gave us a hint that radiation itself is an immune event. And so one of the things that we've been looking at very hard is what is the, the nature of the immune event that happens post radiation? And so we know a lot now now. And so some of this is from our own work, but some of it is from many of my uh, hardworking colleagues that showed that radiation actually releases specific kinds of danger signals. And so that's what you see in this first part in which you see a lot of proteins from dying cells getting released. And those things actually attract immune cells. And then the second part that I think is underappreciated is that radiation also causes antigen presentation. So like the um, question about whether you have immune cells that respond to your tumor, radiation has the ability to kill cells and they get eaten almost like an in situ vaccine. And so we see that um, immune cells come up and especially T cells that are very important for targeting tumors and that this leads to another response. And then in many situations, um, you can clear the tumor um, with uh, radiation, but it, part of it underlies its efficacy, we believe, is its, also its ability to stimulate um, a de novo immune response. And so one of the things about the potential of radiation is there are two kind of aspects of it is that perhaps it can make not only um, uh, immu bigger immune responses, but it can also make better immune responses. So not only does it augment inflammation, but it also can make maybe new T cells or have your T cells recognize new things. And so, um, and so then we would like to look at synergy. So of course, we've already talked about local responses. And so I won't belabor the oligometastases point, but it also integrates well with immunotherapy. So as many of you know, sometimes you have 90% of all your disease addressed by immunotherapy, but there's 10% of it left. And those can still be addressed. If you address them by radiation, you can have a dual purpose in the sense that it can control it both locally, but it may also um, enhance the systemic response. And then some of that is that this distant response response question is that if it functions as a vaccine, can we get it to um, improve immunotherapy responses? And so there have been a number of clinical trials. So over the ensuing years, since the discovery of the Postel paper, uh, many of my colleagues and us included have participated in the trials where we've been looking at all sorts of uh, different kinds of immune responsive diseases, primarily actually melanoma, which is one of the first uh, index cases. And um, unfortunately, what you see here is that when we've combined it, um, in fairness, these are patients who have gotten under many layers of treatment. So they've often, they've had three to five different lines of treatment, many of which have failed immunotherapy, we do have a response rate. So some patients do respond, but of course, um, when you see it, it's kind of disappointing, right? So this summary is like, we thought that there would be like, because we understood the biology so well, that perhaps it would be like gangbusters, right? That we would, we would see huge responses, but it's 10 to 30%, which, you know, in many ways, in fairness, is pretty good for patients who'd gone through so many lines of treatment um, and that there's any responders, but in some, but obviously is not, not where we want to be. So kind of a lot of the research going forward in radiation and um, has been, you know, what to understand why is this synergy been more so modest and what can we do to make it better? And so, um, one of the things that we've done is, you know, we've seen that it elicited a good local response, but um, but it has a limited systemic response. So why why is this? And so we've taken uh, mice in which we've looked at, uh, um, uh, these are modeling, so we can look at tumors and then look at T cells that are specific for the tumor. And then you give them radiation and then you look at their blood. And you can see that in fact, um, you know, that you can see that these uh, locally, they have an increase in the number of um, circulating T cells. But then when you look at it in the blood, 
you can't find them anymore, right? So they're in the tumor that you've treated, but they're not in the blood. And so we've looked at this by something called single cell sequencing. And so we take out these tumors and then um, both from uh, patients, but also from uh, from mice. And we've looked at these. And so this uh, this particular example is uh, from, uh, from, mouse, from mice because we wanted to be able to look uh, at different time points. So, um, so we took these out and we looked to see, so what happens? And what's interesting, I think, just to see is that you can see that radiation actually stimulates PDL1. So that's important. So we knew that we, we need to have that as a backbone for the blockade. But what you also see is that there's these dramatic shifts in the immune population. So I labeled the two that we think are the most important, which are T cells, which um, we've had a lot of talking about, um, but also another one that is very common in tumors called macrophages. And so macrophages have these very complex immune responses, but one of the ones that we think is most common for them is to suppress um, immune responses. And so we see that radiation has a dual function in which it not only stimulates T cell responses, but it can also stimulate um, macrophage responses, which are negative. And this is probably biologically driven in the sense that um, as we understand the immunobiology, we are exposed to radiation at all times, right? So even right now, we're probably having cells that are irradiated, but you want them to be silent, right? You don't want to have inflammation constantly. So it gets cleared, but part of it is it gets recognized and then suppressed. And so kind of our goal has been to sort of understand how do we improve this combination of radiation plus a uh, backbone of PD-1 and can we get rid of it? And so kind of zip through these, but I think one of the questions has been dosing. And so we think that there are specific kinds of dosing that are better than others. So you can choose to have either big one dose because we have the ability to do that, or you can have smaller little doses. And we think that there's actually a Goldilocks zone for immunotherapy in which you have modestly high doses that are given over a short period of time. And what you can see here is that stimulates T cells better than either um, than the than the big single dose, which has been one of our common uh, common treatment regimens. And um, and when we look at back in patients, you can see that in fact, um, not only does that happen in mice, but in patients, you see that they have far more circulating T cells. We don't know if they're specific, but they definitely generate more specific T cells or more T cells when you give the shorter moderate dose or medium dose uh, um, regimens. And, um, and then of course there's timing. And so as you see that there's a cadence to it. So unlike any of the other therapies we have, radiation is very timing specific. We know exactly when we give it. And so you know exactly what happens post radiation. And so this ability for us to understand timing might be very important. So when should we give um, doses? And so I think a lot of the trials that we've been working on have been doing things like combining radiation and PD-1 on a backbone, but then targeting some of these macrophages later. So you can see that it comes up first, but then you have to wait. And so we have some of these timed uh, timing questions that are really important and take advantage of our understanding of the immunobiology. And, um, you know, just as a teaser, I mean, I uh, actually I had a different picture here, but, uh, but, um, but, um, but this one is basically we showed that, you know, um, we now are starting to know, understand that there's going to be a PD-1 backbone on everything, right? So in melanoma, PD-1 is just de rigueur, right? Everybody's going to get it. That's just the way it is. And um, But now we need to figure out what is the next step. So we're going to add radiation and PD-1 as a backbone for some of these trials. And then where do we go next? And so I put some examples of some of the uh, open trials, some of which are here, some of which are other at um, other places, including MassGen and MD Anderson, where we're looking at a number of different kinds of immune agents, some of which are things that are designed to enhance the response, and some of which are designed to prevent them from being suppressed. And so we're trying lots of different strategies. And just one of the examples here is in mice, but you can see that um, here where um, you can combine some of these uh, drugs with radiation and you get some response, but not much, which is what we've been seeing in patients. And this is even mirrored in mice, but then you can add things that can actually dramatically increase this synergy. And we're hoping to test that now. And so, um, so ultimately, you know, kind of where this goes is that we know that radiation can synergize with checkpoint. We have examples, and we also have some trial data that a small percentage is still here, but we think that you need bigger fractions. So that really matters. And that short courses are really important and that we think better combinations are important to take advantage of it. So. All right, thank you. So you can see how excited and why I'm so excited to work with Steve. He's great. A couple of things there, Steve. De rigor, that's kind of going to come into my uh, uh, 
vocabulary two were uh star wars people not star trek people <laughs> but three we should talk more i think the, the main point is we should talk more because there are newer drugs that can target those macrophages and so that's what dr memi and i will start talking about on monday when we we're in clinic together but i I, I'd like to bring up uh, Dr. Mammy to do a, another staple talk for Dr. Uh, Dr. Sapna. <laughs> it's going to have a lot of doctors. So a long time ago, I told uh, Sapna, Sapna that she should come and work with me or I'd like to work with her more, but I, I have the next best thing. <laughs> uh, Dr. Mammy will come and talk to us about where he's taking the ocular melanoma program here and and what's happening everywhere. Uh, uh, contrary to the belief of this meeting, it doesn't just happen in MD Anderson or Mass General, but there's a lot of great work going on and uh, Dr. Memi will let us know about those. Next best thing. <laughs> That's a lot to live up to. <laughs> So I'm going to try and summarize. I know this is the last talk and everybody's a little tired. So trying to make it short, uh, but still trying to cover some of the data that's been generated in uh, uveal melanoma. And uh, we'll talk about that. So objectives are, I covered a little bit of this uh, on last year's symposium, background, prognostic markers, staging, and what that allows us to do in terms of following the patients. Um, where are we with metastatic disease management um, and what are some of the future therapies that uh, are, are on the horizon? So a little picture of what exactly uveal myeloma. A lot of the time uh, when I speak to patients that are newly diagnosed, uh, they never even knew that this disease actually existed. It's like, oh, melanoma can happen in the eye. Oh, does it go from the skin to that place, or is it is it a diagnosis on its own? And and it's um, you know this is one of the common uh, adult ocular malignancies. It can happen in a number of places, as you can see. Okay, so a little bit of background. Um, it's most common primary ocular melanoma or um, a malignancy of the eye in the adults. About five percent of all melanomas. Um, it, it's not that common, as you can see from the incident rate. Uh, there are some risk factors, but they're not the same as for cutaneous melanoma. And uh, unfortunate situations, a lot of the patients go on to develop metastatic disease. And uh, historically speaking, it's been difficult to control. The, the therapeutic regimens that we've had in the past weren't um, very adequate in a sense, and also they weren't very uh, tolerable either. Uh, so we push along and try to find therapies that are more effective and, and better tolerated. So this is just a slide on how we stage melanoma and what that helps us with is how to approach the surveillance of these patients, you know, if are they at high risk of recurrences or not, and that helps us along with that. Uh, but to sort of make that picture a little bit better, a little more complete, um, we do uh, get sort of gene expression, certain DNA markers that are present in these melanomas. And based on those markers, we divide or, or stratify these melanomas into low risk versus high risk, class one, class two. And that allows us again to perhaps design clinical trials for post-operative therapy or post-primary therapy of ocular melanoma that will address the highest risk patient population, whereas the low risk patient population could be followed along. Um, and as you can tell, even on a longer term follow-up that these classifications stand test of time. And furthermore, you can add other pieces of information, for example, PRAME to this uh, gene classification that allows us to further risk stratify these patients and potentially um, see if there are adjuvant options that could be explored in clinical trial setting. And this PRAME thing will be important a little bit later. Dr. Hamid uh, sort of, you know, talked about it in a different setting. And I, uh, I believe, uh, uh, Dr. Sullivan had also uh, hinted towards that. So 
this is a quick slide on adjuvant therapy for uh, melanoma. Unfortunately, a number of trials have happened. Uh, most have been small, but none have really shown any benefit. So at the moment, outside a clinical trial, there is no approved adjuvant therapy for uh, uveal melanoma. This is a uh, bring to real life uh, sort of, you know, statistics of uveal melanoma, how scary of a disease it is and, and what the outcome for these patients with metastatic disease can be and highlights how much work that needs to be done. So in the metastatic setting, um, most of the time, these patients will be exposed to a number of different approaches for their disease control. Uh, let it be a liver-directed therapy that of various types, a hepatic artery embolization with different uh, agents, for example, um, immunoembolization, a lot of it's done at uh, Th uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, with Dr. Soto's lab um, and clinic, chemoembolization, radioembolization, Y90 treatment is one of those. Uh, hepatic artery infusion, a recently published article from Europe, uh, a group in German group, I believe, showed benefit of uh, uh, percutaneous uh, infusion. Um, also, Delcath is um, another system that, that goes after the same approach to improve um, liver uh, sort of recurrences. This is the Delcath uh, clinical trial, uh, percutaneous hepatic uh, perfusion with melphalan for patients with ocular melanoma that's metastatic to the liver. And it showed a very good control um, of, of disease in the liver and also overall survival advantage. Um, I'm not sure why this is not FDA approved yet, but the data has been out there for a, for a while now. Um, and so the next thing is, is there anything else within the uh, uveal melanoma cells, a mistake in the pathway that allows it to grow, progress? Is there something we can target? So there are a number of mistakes that have been identified in uveal melanoma, but so far we haven't found a silver bullet for it. For example, in chronic myelogenous, um, myelogenous leukemia, uh, you know, one of the drugs that was developed, Gleevec, essentially has changed the, the nature of that disease. And there's a, a strong effort uh, in, in the uveal melanoma to find that silver bullet for that one mistake that we could take advantage of. And so far, we haven't seen uh, significant improvement with these number of different targeted therapy, for example, with trametinib or serafinib or silametinib. Uh, we haven't really seen a lot of benefit, but time are changing. And so this is a study of IDE-196 in patients with solid tumors, harboring DNA Q11 mutation uh, or PR, uh, PRKC uh, fusions. Uh, this is uh, uh, um, trial by IDEA, a pharmaceutical company, and their press release indicated that when they treated uh, metastatic uveal melanoma patients with uh, darvocertib, which is a PKC protein kinase C inhibitor, along with crizotinib, which is approved for uh, ALK or ROS gene rearrangement in metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. When they combine these two drugs in various settings, for example, they've treated un- um, patients who have never been treated for metastatic UV melanoma and patients who've experienced other treatments. And once they've uh, given these two drugs in combination with that, they've seen a reasonable response. Uh, for example, if any of the patients, if they've seen prior therapy, um, 30, uh, they looked at 35 patients and 11 of them had uh, overall response. Uh, whereas if the patients have, hadn't had any therapies in the past, uh, the response rate is about 50%. My only caveat to this is these are numbers that are, that are, that are very small. We need a larger population with uh, to sort of establish this experience and the trials are actually in an expansion phase and an ongoing and we hope to see the data soon. Um, I think theme of my talk, even before when I was talking about adjuvant neoadjuvant therapy in melanoma was not only to have an effective therapy is to have a therapy that's tolerable. Um, you know, what's the point of giving a therapy it's, if it's going to make you sick and, and lay in bed at home or not be able to enjoy the life that you want to live? Um, so going along the same theme, the, the, the toxicity profile is actually fairly well tolerated. Uh, great high grade events are small, um, and uh, grade one, two events are essentially all we, and most of them are GI focused. 
So we talked about immunotherapy in a number of different contexts and what is the role of immunotherapy in uveal melanoma. And this slide essentially shows you that uveal melanoma most commonly tend to be cold tumor. They're not very inflamed tumors. Um, because of that, the response to immunotherapy has been as good as what's been in cutaneous melanomas. But um, there are few percent of the patients that will benefit from uh, these therapies. And that's the trial that led by Dr. Patel yet again, and uh, showed, you know, about 18% response rate in some of these metastatic uveal melanoma. And we didn't see any new toxicity signals, uh, you know, when, when these patients were treated. So it's a reasonable option for some, for some of these patients. And the same trial was actually taken um, uh, under back in, in uh, Spain as well, showing a very similar. So essentially, uh, both of these trials are stating that there is about 18 to 20 percent of the patients of uveal melanoma that tends to be immune therapy resistant, but still could be captured and and uh, with a reasonable control. And this is uh, one of the newest drugs uh, that got approved uh, about a year or two ago. Um, and that's the class that Dr. Hamid actually elaborated on the impacts. Um, and this is, the CD, uh, it's a bispecific antibody. Um, I call them T, I think a lot of the people call them T cell engagers. And one end again to review is binds to the T cells, the other end binds to the uh, to the tumor itself at the GP100 site. The only catch here is that you have to have a particular uh, human leukocyte antigen, HLAO201. And if you don't have that, you're not a candidate for this therapy. Um, I believe the, the, the immunocore data shows that there are about 40% of the, the patients who are HLA positive for this particular drug. So they are a very good candidate, which means there are 60% of metastatic UV melanoma patients that aren't candidate for that therapy that requires additional work from all of us. So this is a trial that was published in Young General Medicine in, uh, in 2021. These are some of the, um, on the upper left corner are the, the basic characteristics of these patients. Um, and in the middle typed up uh, are some of the uh, inclusion, exclusion, and some of the other details of this trial showing overall survival benefit on the bottom left and uh, overall well-tolerated therapy. Most of the adverse events that happened, they happened within the first few weeks of this drug being given. Um, most serious thing that we worry about while you're on, uh, when somebody's on this drug is, is what's called the cytokine release syndrome, which is essentially is a, a chemical storm that the chemicals come from the immune system and all these inflammatory markers that are circulating in the blood and impacting your respiration, your blood pressures, your, your heart rates and et cetera, your um, volume status and sometimes liver function and, and such. And, but again, uh, something that we monitor and we monitor within the hospital setting, but at the same time, these are uh, well-studied phenomena and, and relatively easy to control issues. The next T-cell engager is Dr. Hamid's gone over it. This is a slide you're seeing about fourth time today. Um, and uh, this is um, Dr. Actually, Hamid uh, already went over the detail of this phase one study where it looked at multiple different tumor types that are prime positive, PRAME positive, and again, also HLAO201 positive, and uh, multiple different tumor types. And I want your attention on the far left, upper top, the blue lines that are falling down and the waterfall plot showing a very good response. And these responses are durable and uh, overall therapy is well tolerated. We have few patients on that this particular trial benefiting from this. And last but not the least, uh, Dr. Hamid um, also went over the TIL therapy and there is some role uh, of TIL therapy in metastatic uveal melanoma. Unfortunately, uh, the, the current data shows that it's not as effective um, in uh, uveal melanoma as it has been proven to in uh, cutaneous melanoma. Again, potentially an option, perhaps newer engineered uh, adopted T-cell therapy will be better options. One of the trials that I wanted to highlight was uh, treatment fields. Uh, so essentially what this trial is doing is combining two different modalities of therapy. Um, so tumor treatment fields is a concept of generating electrical fields around the tumor uh, to 
to, to allow control of it. Um, and the basic concept is when the cell is dividing, the chromosomes are moving on these charge strands called microtubules. Along with that, there are charge proteins, molecules, stabilizing all that apparatus. When you focus um, uh, electrical fields on that, it disrupts that array. And that disruption leads to cell death. So our thought here is that when we apply this particular tumor treatment fields, along with immunotherapy, we'll have a better response. As a matter of fact, this is a trial in melanoma, but a trial in mesothelium is already taking place, a trial in uh, um, GBM, glioblastoma multiforme has been taking place. Matter of fact, it's a approved therapy in GBM in, in second line setting, I believe. So uh, we hope to accrue patient. I think we're treating our first patient on this study next week. Um, excited to, to be part of this. Um, I'm going to end it here and uh, we'll move on to the question and answer session, I believe. Okay, we're going to move on to uh, the question and answer session. Can I ask the speakers to come on up? And we will do this. Uh... I'll give one of these. There. Uh, people here, if you just raise your hands, uh, Sam Guild will come by and we'll go through your, your questions. There are a couple points that I wanted to make before we get started. I wanted to thank all of our uh, audiovisual people here who are helping because there are a hundred plus people who signed up to receive the videos here. And the videos will go on our site, will go on AIM site, and we'll be there for patients who may just be diagnosed or may reach a uh, a, a fork in the road of their therapy. So uh, the ability to save that is, is so important. Um, but we'll get started. And uh, remember, your questions can come in through the chat, or if you're here live, raise your hand and we'll get there. Um, let me go to Dr. Patel. We're going to talk about circulating tumor DNA. And a patient here asks, First of all, someone said to Dr. Patel, excellent presentation. So we've Thanks. we've answered that live. The second one is when, and I'll paraphrase, when do you think the appropriate time is to check circulating tumor DNA for patients? And is that is there an ability to share that data with patients in a clear manner? Yeah, I think as I mentioned, there's multiple scenarios when you can check it. You can check it before surgical removal of a melanoma. You can check it post-surgery. You can check it when monitoring, or you can track response to treatment in the metastatic setting. And right now, I think it's hard to say what the optimal situation would be, but I think we would all like to use liquid biopsies to detect somebody's melanoma at an early stage, at an early moment when it's going to need another intervention. Um, right now, there are some commercial assays that could be used, the Garden Platform, Foundation Medicine, but what they will do is sequence for a lot of mutations that are not necessarily melanoma specific. And that makes interpretation incredibly difficult. Those results though, because they're billed to your insurance, they can be shared with you in real time. But I think they can also cause a lot of confusion for somebody who has something that's positive that's not relevant to melanoma. Do they now need to be looking for another cancer or is it just a, you know, just an um, aberrant signal, not clinically significant as we would say. Um, it, the best possible scenario right now I'd say is to sign up for a clinical trial that's looking at these liquid biopsies. And then eventually, you know, those, those results will become unblinded or public facing. And, but I, I would, you know, I, I think it's, um, the time is rich to kind of see when we can follow these things at any moment in time. So there's probably a clinical trial option for that somewhere. 
Thank you. Any questions here? We'll go to another question for Dr. Sullivan then. If you are about to start a patient on BRAF MEC or extracranial metastatic melanoma with a mutation, how do you choose from the combinations? What are the pros and cons that you discuss with your patients? And wh where would you think about clinical trials? The clinical trial piece is a little challenging. I showed a 50 patient study that took us five years to accrue across 15 or 20 sites. It's really difficult to, to enroll patients who have BRAF mutations onto clinical trials before they start BRAF inhibitor therapy, and then also after. And that's for a lot of different reasons, including um, patients can can have a lot of issues with the immune therapy, or they can have disease in certain places that are excluded on clinical trials. That all said, if we have a clinical trial open in that space, we often will discuss it with our patients. Additionally, in terms of choosing amongst the three uh, standard of care BRAF MEC combinations, we tend to think that they're all about the same in terms of effectiveness. We don't think that any one combination is better than any other combination. However, then we choose based on the side effect profile. And, and the side effect profile of dibrafenib and trametinib, which is the first combination approved, tends to have more fevers and a fever syndrome that can become pretty um, annoying to like impactful on quality of life for patients. Um, and though it's only five pills. So like from a pill load, it's not that many. Um, Vemorafen and tends to be um, associated with a sensitivity to sunlight. And so people can actually have spend five minutes in the sun and then have a horrific blistering sunburn. So in the winter time in Boston, it's fine. Outside of that scenario, it's not an easy <laughs> treatment. And it's really hard for, I mean, patients will still, I have a one woman who's been on this for almost seven or eight years. And every now and again, she just forgets, or she's like, I found myself in a place where there's more sun than I thought. And then she gets a blistering sunburn. It's usually on her hands because she knows to cover up, but it, it's just, it's a really ch challenging. The third combination of oncografin and binimetinib doesn't have those two side effects. It causes more nausea. There's a lot of pills. I think it's 12 pills a day. Um, so those are the downside. Um, you don't have to worry about food. The dibrafen and trametinib, there's like a three hour period where you can't eat when you take it around the treatments, which makes it more difficult. So, so it, it really just comes down to lifestyle approaches. And what we tend to just do is offer oncografen and binimetinib because we don't have to deal with the fever syndrome and we don't have to deal with the photosensitivity or the, the sensitivity of the sun. Oh, great. Great. I got one for Dr. Moyers here. This is, I'm going to paraphrase. None of you really spoke on mucosal melanoma. Any points to be made on mucosal melanomas? Therapies, is there a difference? What, you know, things like that. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, I think several things. We know that the mutational, um, you know, burden is different. There's few people they'll have the BRAF mutation. Um, we also know that in regards to the other therapies, that the immunotherapy doesn't seem to work as well. Um, but I think most people are still using a combination of um, dual checkpoint for those treat for those therapies. Um, uh, I think. At some centers, they incorporate radiation a little bit more in regards to the mucosal melanoma, um, particularly after surgery. Um, I, I'm trying to think of any. I mean, I think those would be the main things that I would. Bring up. Okay, thank you for the next one for Dr. Shao. So I'm going to add to this one. The question itself is: Can a tumor site be radiated? a year or more since tumor removal, but I'm gonna ask you also to say, how do you choose the optimal site to radiate? And are there sites that you would avoid? 
Um, well, generally speaking, um, they can we can we can irradiate after a year, but it would be you know we're really trying to think about reducing you know recurrence rates, of course. And so you know if you've been a year without disease, I mean I think that that would be a good sign that you know you probably wouldn't benefit from it. Like I mean of course there could be long term things, but that's that's a pretty good long time. Um, and then when we're choosing sites, I think you know we do have to think. So obviously if we're doing an aggressive oligometastatic approach, we're not like choosing sites to some extent, right? We wait, we look at all the progressing sites and we we treat all of them if we can. Um, the um, but if it's if if we're also trying to have a dual purpose in which we're trying to stimulate an immune response, we do generally favor um, soft tissue sites. So as opposed to, for instance, bone sites or brain sites, which generally have a very different immune pattern. And so we tend to like um, like if I had to rank them, my favorite are I guess if there was a favorite um, it would be um, you know we generally I would do lung nets first um, over and then um, uh, nodal nets and then um, and then probably um, liver or some of the other ones. The liver is a little bit more complicated because of uh, it has a very different immune, also a very uh, unique immune profile. Thanks. Um, one for Dr. Memi. So we're going to try and keep these general. So there's a lot of questions that come in and say like, okay, this is my situation, but this is a generalization of what the patient has said. Uh, been treated with single agent PD-1 and then moved on and got a combination with CTLA-4. Is this the right time and now needs another option? Should What should they go to? Should they go to uh, a LAG-3 option or what else is available? So I think the right step would be a clinical trial. Um, I think the data has shown that trying to do lag three combination with the checkpoint inhibitor doesn't buy you a good response rate. Um, the response rate tends to be only about 10 to 12% at best with after checkpoint experience. For example, if somebody's trying to use up dual lag after PD-1 uh, and progress um, had had progression. So my advice at that point would be to seek out a clinical trial um, we're eagerly awaiting, uh, you know, FDA approval of the TIL therapy that I think would be uh, well suited in that space. But as of now, I think my answer would be, and my advice would be to seek out a clinical trial. Perfect. And I think I'm going to do the final one to Dr. Patel. Uh, so... For a patient that just is diagnosed, what are the optimal times that they should be checking CT DNA? And for a metastatic patient, what are the optimal times? So the idea of zero conversion is um, probably has some teeth to it. If you are newly diagnosed, getting some CT DNA checked then pre-surgical. And then postoperatively, within what we would typically say is one to four weeks post-op, check and see your CT DNA or CTC then. Being positive before surgery and going to negative, this was one of the curves I, I tried to show, um, that seems to be associated with the best, the favorable, the most, the longest melanoma-free period. Um, but just recognize that CTC liquid biopsy, CT DNA, the caveat is it's a tube of blood. It's one tube of blood typically that we check for these markers. And if that tube is negative, it doesn't mean that the second or third or fourth or fifth tube that we collect wouldn't have been, if that tube is negative, it doesn't mean another tube wouldn't have been positive. Um, so preoperative, postoperative for somebody who's newly diagnosed, that seems like a reasonable amount of time for somebody who's metastatic. It's very similar. It's at the time of starting your metastatic therapy, and then somewhere around four weeks, six weeks, or nine weeks, there's data in BRAF uh, targeted therapy to look at four weeks. And then in uveal melanoma with Tibentifus to look at nine weeks and probably any variation in between also makes sense. And again, you're just looking for is that CT DNA level stable? Is it increasing or decreasing? The other caveat in metastatic disease though is increasing CT DNA does not tell you the source of where it's coming from. So you could be getting CT DNA released in greater quantity because your tumors are actually getting lysed 
and getting destroyed. So just to, with a grain of salt that not every increase necessarily is a bad sign when you're talking about CT DNA. CTCs, it's a different story. If your CTCs are increasing, you know, that's worrisome, but not always with CT DNA. Perfect. You answered another question <clears throat> just through that. <clears throat> so as we come to an end, I'm just going to ask if there are any further questions here. Yes. And we'll go through the, the last three. Uh, yes. Doc question to Dr. Sullivan, more about the BRAF biology. Is um, BRAF mutation is a relatively early or late event in terms of tumor evolution? And can you do pre-screening for BRAF mutation? Uh, it's it's definitely early. If you look at moles, so atypical nevi, they very commonly will have a BRAF mutation, probably at a higher rate than melanomas. So we think it's the driver and with it, it, so a melanoma that has a BRAF mutation, it's it's a it's the earliest event, um, probably. Uh, I mean, there's certainly UV irradiation, other things, you know, if it's but but it's probably the you know one of the earliest events. Okay, and the second quick question: Why BRAF? Like, probably it's the best driver gene in melanoma. Fifty percent of patients all have BRAF. Why not MEK mutation? Why not ERK mutation? Why BRAF in everybody? I don't know why is the sky blue. I mean, <laughs> like it's it, it, it's a. I mean, if you look across cancers, there are a few very important types of mutations that we see. We see BRAF V six hundred E, KRAS G twelve, and G thirteen, um, and those are those are oncogenes. Like those are across a number of different types of cancers. It just, I think what ends up happening is that there's probably some damage to cells and then that cell lucks into that mutation and right. If you just put a BRAF or a KRAS or any oncogene mutation into a cell, it'll shut down and, and go away because that's the normal process. P53 kicks in and, and the, the cell can't function. So there probably are other events to sort of amend my answer to the first question, but but they're not necessarily as specifically categorizable as the event of the oncogene coming in and the cell doesn't shut down. Um, but BRAF and KRAS tend to be across a lot of different cancers. And so I don't know why it's so good at causing cancer, but it definitely, when when that cancer cell lucks into that mutation, it doesn't lose it because it gives it a clear advantage. Um, for whatever reason, in melanoma, we don't see a lot of KRAS mutations. We see NRAS mutations. There are some KRAS mutations. They're not very common, probably one or one, one to 2%, something like that. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not sure I understand exactly why, what's different about melanocytes and the biology of melanocytes that an NRAS mutation is either more likely to happen um, or more likely uh, to, to lead to uh, a, a driver to be the driver mutation that sees NRAS mutations are seen across other cancers, but they're usually less common. Um, you can see them in colorectal cancer, but they're less common than KRAS. You can actually see them in thyroid cancer, probably a little higher than, than KRAS. So, but why exactly? I'm not sure if anybody knows the answer, but I definitely don't. All right. We had another question. Please go ahead. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Patel. First of all, wonderful talk. Um, so regarding the panel that it was used in the Invigo study that was based on a 16 gene panel from Signatera, you mentioned that um, there are a couple of studies where the panel is tested in melanoma. Uh, would you, so the panel that is going to be tested in melanoma, is going to be the same eventually that will be applied for uvel melanoma because I think that the driving mutation are going to be different, right? You know, the interesting thing about that Signatera assay is that it's tumor informed. So each patient's tumor informs the signature that you'll then go looking for in the blood. So it's personalized. It's personalized for each patient. Yeah. Presumably whatever 16 clonal variants are found in a uveal melanoma would be different than what you would find in a skid melanoma, but they would also be different from patient to patient within a particular disease type. Got it. Thank you. 
All right, one final one in the front here. And and how do we get these um, Omid Hamid paddles here? Are these <laughs> I'm selling them at a hundred dollars each. <laughs> We're obviously a big fan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> Um, first of all, thank you very much. It's a wonderful presentation and feel very lucky to be here. Interesting. Uh, my question for you is, um, for instance, you've been on immunotherapies and targeted therapies for a few years and your cancer, you know, is stable, but not NED. At what point do you move on to maybe till therapy or another therapy to possibly go, or you just continue on the current treatment? Treatments, future. I guess. Thank, treatment. Thanks, Dr. Sullivan. <laughs> well, he was looking at you, again. Dr. Patel, but fair enough. It's a really good question. Uh, you know, I, I think well, sometimes what we'll do, and sometimes scans are stable, stable, rock stable scans, particularly if there was initial regression and then things are rock stable. Sometimes what we'll do is a PET scan to see is it actually hot? Like is is there uptake of of sugar suggesting that that tumor is active? Um, if it's not active, that might be a reason to even consider a treatment break, which sounds crazy. It's the exact opposite of what you're saying. Like, wait, you can de-escalate. So you know, if there's proof, and I think at some level, someday we'll do CTVMA if CTVMA is negative and the PET's negative, we might feel comfortable stopping. Um, and we certainly will stop for some patients. But if it's there never was a lot of regression, but it's just stable and the PET scan's hot. We tend to continue treatment and occasionally bring in our friends from radiation oncology or surgery to sort of clean up the mess that we haven't been able to. Um, so sometimes we think about that as an option. Um, it's, I, I don't know how you bill for it, but, but you know, like it's, it's an active cancer that's not going away. Sometimes we'll think about that, but very commonly, we we talk ourselves and our patients into saying, let's leave well enough alone. We don't know that switching will be a bad idea, but it might be. And, you know, I think if somebody's tolerating a treatment, it's controlling their disease for a while. Um, it's sort of like, you know, you don't stop betting on a winning horse. It's, right. it, it may not be the Kentucky Derby, but but if you're still winning, races or if you're still getting benefit it it does it does feel sometimes like we're we're trying to outthink ourselves and maybe even though it's not perfect it's really good if patients tolerating therapy doing well living their life all of those things like we feel I mean, it happens in uvm all the time particularly with tibentafos patients don't tend to have regressions of their tumor um but we kind of like continue to treat them because they seem to keep living and living well. So, no, wonderful advice. Thank you very much. And thank you all for everything. It's been so, awesome. I'm going to end it, but also say it was a great question that we're trying to answer with Tabentafus. Also, there's this new field coming with radiomics to evaluate the changes in the density and the, in the, in the tumor itself on imaging that can hopefully help us in the future. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming. Our speakers, if you love them, please follow them on Twitter. Raise your hand if you're on Twitter. <laughs> Raise your hand if you're on uh, Snapchat. <laughs> Dr. Sullivan's not on Twitter, but in that case, I will give you all his personal cell number. <laughs> I want to thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, yes, it is. All right. Thank you so much. Bye bye.